level of the business. And there's a certain point where you're doing a disservice to your team and your business by doing that. So you have to realize that you at, you know, 40% is way more of a detriment than someone else 80, 90%, right? So that's been over the past, I'd say year has been my biggest growth is learning how to actually be a CEO, how to actually take a step back and trust your team, right? You hire these people for a reason, put your trust in them and let them flourish. This episode is brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, CEO and president of Ling and Louis Restaurants, John Bankwell. My man, John, are you feeling unstoppable today? Always feeling unstoppable. Dude, I'm psyched to be here, and I, you're my favorite type of interview. Uh, when I when I when when there's somebody in my network who's discovered the show and who's a fan of the show who's also killing it because you know what you're in for. You know yep. the kind of questions I'm going to ask. You know the kind of interviews you like to listen to. Absolutely. So whenever I have these opportunities to connect, and it's kind of a little surreal for me because for the longest time I was just putting out episodes, not thinking like you just you know you just publish them to this this media host and that's the end. It goes and dies there. But it's kind of cool after 10 years that there's people listening to the show who honestly are just you know successful, great people, and it's like the the biggest like honor for me, you know, to know yeah. that like people like you are listening to the show, having success and um, thank you for your support. man. No, man. Thank you. Because honestly, a lot of my success comes from listening to oh, people man. that you've interviewed and, and you getting all of that out there and, and just your mission and everything that you're looking to do for the restaurant industry is a lot of what I really want to do for the industry as well. What is that? So, uh, it's to change people's perceptions, right? Yeah. We came, you know, I, I think, you know, COVID obviously uh, was a big blow for our industry and everyone else's industries. But, you know, we really saw that there are a lot of people that didn't feel appreciated in the restaurant industries. There are a lot of people that didn't think that it was a real career path. Right. right. And I want to change that because there is so much possibility. And I'm proof of that. Right. right? To go from, you know, just a, a, a manager to owning a company and being a franchisor has been a very surreal experience for me and I want to be able to share that and tell people right this could be you in the defense of the rest of the world I think we could have been better in the past about making this a real industry for people absolutely you know and I think absolutely hopefully through these conversations empowering people raising the bar on restaurants uh, we will you know hopefully make it more appealing and attractive yes and bring people back absolutely so, um, before we dive into your success quote, I just want to make sure the listeners know uh, what we're working with today. So you got three brands under your belt. Correct. Uh, seven restaurants in three different states. Uh, Ling and Louis times five, right? Uh, correct. Yes. Yep. yep. And then uh, Ling's Walk Shop here in Arizona. Yep. And then also we have Ghost um, Street Asian Taqueria. Correct. Awesome. And that's uh, that's just a, a, a ghost kitchen or a virtual restaurant that we it. operate out of our Ling and Louis oh, here cool. in Scottsdale. Um one of these days we'll have a, yeah. a brick and mortar, but yeah, we'll, we'll dive deep into yeah. that. I can't wait. Uh, so before we dive into who you are and how you got to where you are today, let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? I think it's already rolling, dude, honestly. All right. So uh, this one is from Jim Sullivan. So he's a guy that really delves into hospitality and uh, follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, but it's something that I shared with all of our teams and it's, Leadership is a role you grow into gradually, no matter how long you've been in the role. In the short term, you are as good as your intensity. In the long term, you are only as good as your consistency. And in between that intensity and consistency lives clarity and persistency. Ooh, dive into that. There, there's a lot to unpack there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, you guys talk about Kaizen a lot mm-hmm. uh, on this podcast, and that's one of our... You know, that lies in one of our core values at Ling and Louis Restaurants. It's continuous improvement and always growing. And it's about showing up every day, wanting to do better than the day before, right? And, you know, we, we have some young managers on our team, and it's trying to teach them that you're going to make mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes and keep growing. And the one thing that's, I think, probably the biggest mistake that young managers make is not being consistent, right? So we try to use our core values as a base of this is where your decision making should lie, right? This is what you should use when an issue arises, bring it back down to the core values and 
be consistent in those. Right. Because if we're not consistent in those, then what good are the, the core values? Yeah. Why do yeah. we even have them? Yeah. The words I, I echo a lot on the show, the ready, fire, aim, right? And it's mm-hmm. a, a never-ending process of ready, fire, aim. And take, yeah. take a risk. Take a chance. Yeah. Sometimes you think the right thing to do to grow isn't always necessarily the right thing. Uh, and you won't know until you've tried. Right. And I, I'm, I'm not to bring the conversation back to me, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, but, <laughs> but, like, I'm learning this right now as I go because I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to push the envelope. There are more restaurant podcasts than ever before. And, I, and like, the analogy is you might have been the first amazing restaurant in your market. But guess what? The the, the tide's rising and there's more right. restaurants coming. And if you don't evolve and grow, then you're, you're not going to be the best you know restaurant on the street anymore. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel with my podcast with all these new restaurant podcasts coming. It's like I can't even keep track. So Nick, I'm being forced to, to evolve and grow. And you got to take stabs in the dark and try new things. And sometimes what you think is the right isn't right. And you don't know until you're about to like, when you get into it, you're like, I don't think this is right. Right. You know? So anyway, great way yeah. to get this thing started. No, I think um, that's great. And yeah. I think there's, there's, if you have humility in like when you make a mistake, so if you take a stab and you make a mistake, it's okay to say, well, that was wrong. Let me roll it back. Sorry guys. If I screwed anything up for you. Right. Right. But let's try this path. Right. Because we think this path might be better. Right. You don't right. know until you know. Yep. So, but you gotta, you gotta try to find out. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome stuff, man. So where does it make sense to start sharing your story? Take us to the beginning. Oh, geez. Um, probably when I was, I think I was 16, uh, I started working in my first restaurants. Actually, right down the street from from where we are right now. Uh, it was called Mimi's Cafe. Uh, they're a national brand, semi-national brand, but it was mostly breakfast, cafe food, that kind of stuff. And I started as a host. And... Uh, Every Saturday and Sunday, the place was packed, right? And I was I was usually the one that was running the wait list, taking everyone's names and, you know, quoting them how long they're going to be. And there was just something about that environment, that hustle, that bustle that I just really, really fell in love with. And, you know, when you're going through high school, you don't, you're not supposed to know what you want to do with the rest of your life. But I think there was something in the back of my head that said, you know, restaurants, this is, this is where you belong. Right. So, uh, so. Did you, I mean, did you, is that where you stayed or did you, did you have other I, visions for yourself? At this yeah, point? no, I was there for God, uh, I think until my freshman year of college. And then I think I just realized that I needed something different. Uh, you know, we was going to school at ASU and that's in Tucson, right? Uh, no, no down here in Tempe. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't confuse those. You'll, you'll upset a lot of people. Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I ended up working at, I took a busing job at uh, Outback Steakhouse down there. I don't know if I, I, I phrased the question well enough. Mm-hmm. Like when you were working at Mimi's, yeah. um, did you did you like you had this desire? You knew you liked it. Yes. Um, but were you saying to yourself, "This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life"? Or what? no, I don't. Okay. No, I think it was just kind of in the back of my head. Like there was something I I really enjoyed about it, and um, the the team that I worked with, the managers, they were all really, really good to us. And, you know, I think, so I think there was just something that kind of s- planted the seed for me. Was there something that, that you were trying to, like, did you have, so you, you're, this is for now in, in your story, you're mm-hmm. doing it for now. Was there another path that you thought that was right for you? That were you working towards something else? No, like, I had okay. no idea. Right. Like I, when I was little, I wanted to be an air force pilot. Right. Yeah. Like, and then I couldn't get on space mountain without freaking out. So <laughs> I had to put that, to bed right so um i think it was uh, just like a normal kid just trying to figure out where i wanted to go where what i wanted to do where i wanted to go got it um so pick up that train of thought that i I pulled you off of because you're you're kind of you're working in the industry oh yeah so uh went to asu and i was working probably best to work at a restaurant closer to where there's other students and that kind of stuff so i was there for a short time and um then i started i i kind of stumbled upon another restaurant called Seasons Rotisserie and Grill. Okay. What year uh, did you graduate, ASU? I did not graduate. Okay. Shame on me. But <laughs> What year were you in school? Let me ask you that. Uh, I graduated high school in 99, so 2000, 2001, 2002. And how long were you there? Uh, at ASU? Yeah. Uh, I think three years. Okay. Right? And so then, right until 2002. Yeah. So that's, that's when I started with this Seasons Rotisserie and Grill place, and I just started as a busser and moved into serving and uh, bartending, both of which I was absolutely terrible at. Um, you know, it was a small kind of upscale restaurant. Uh, owners was 
was great and you know he had lost some of his other managers and was looking for some of the younger people to step up and I was one of those people that was willing to step up but again kind of that like now seeing that that seed that was planted all those years ago in high school I'm in this upscale restaurant um I was a very very picky eater before that so I was getting into learning all of the all about wine uh tasting things that I'd never tasted before duck and foie gras and you know all these kind of fancy schmancy stuff right and I just really really fell in love with it and I'm like wow this is this is really really cool right like I'm learning about all these wines and um so he asked me to become a manager and I think probably selfishly on his part because he knew he could get me really cheap and I would work my butt off for him um and which all happened right um but that really opened up the door for me to to learn and grow um I don't think necessarily so much in a leadership sense but more in a this is what culinary excellence could be right so uh I think when you start when you're really young as a manager and you're just kind of put into a position and you don't have someone necessarily there to mentor you you're kind of going through the motions and you're you're doing what you think is right for management but you're never actually leading anyone right you're you're counting drawers at the end of the night and you know maybe doing some payroll and but it's it's going through the motions y- exactly yeah, you're, you're collecting right. the, the low road of data that you're yes. going to refer back to for the rest of your right. life and yeah. like you th- that, you know i think i was 20 Nineteen twenty, when this happened, like it was the coolest thing in the world oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, got to do inventory every night, and may have had a bottle or two while I was doing inventory. Right? <laughs> so I don't know how accurate it was, but so um, I want to zoom up to thirty thousand feet real quick and yeah. kind of give the listeners a big picture of kind of like your 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 role. So you, I know you end up at the the Bamboo Club not long after this part of your Correct. life, right? Yep. Because it says from two thousand one to 2006 and then from 2007 to 2008 uh you're at the 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 kona grill and uh-huh. then 2008 to 2000 like a big chunk of your career was with ling louis right? correct yep uh keep on going along that that vein just just giving the dates and the locations yeah so um actually the seasons ended up closing down weird probably okay. because they had a 20 year old losing booze and yeah the- <laughs> <laughs> had a 20 year old running your restaurant um and i had a friend that worked at bamboo club and went over there and uh, the manager there saw me and wanted an interview and um, brought me right in and uh, that's where really uh, not to not to zoom in but that's really where I learned leadership and okay. management right? Got it. at the bamboo yeah um, so but yeah from we're gonna zoom in don't worry I want to get okay. the big picture out and kind of get the idea of where your evolutions were yep. and then we'll zoom in so yep. so uh, 2008 to 2016 was it yep 2008 well 2008 to 2000 nine or 18 i was with ling and louis okay i came on board as the assistant general manager became the general manager pretty quickly um moved into more of a we called it a regional general manager role so i was still responsible for our restaurant here in scottsdale um but also helped with overseeing franchise locations uh and opening them and training the teams um also took on the the bar side of the program we had a an executive chef who's still with us today that does an amazing job um so the two of us just creatively drove the culinary and the the bar program forward um the unique thing about ling and louis was it was managed by a company called desert island restaurants okay okay so desert island restaurants was not only a franchisor of ling and louis but they were a franchisee of Ruth's Chris Steakhouse and Macaroni Grill, all located on the Hawaiian Islands. So uh, our, the original owner, uh, his name was Randy Schock, a uh, great mentor of mine. You know, his idea was, let's do this Asian American concept, Ling and Louis, and franchise it, right? Because I'm a franchisee, and I'm great, and I can do, look at all the, the things that we're doing, and we're changing the, you know, we're pushing Ruth's Chris forward and Macaroni Grill forward. And um, so obviously other franchisees are just like this. Right. So let's do that. And uh, it, I think he learned it didn't quite work out right. that way. Right. Right. So. Um, and then you he, left. Then you left Ling Louis for a period. I did. So he, 
in 2017, 18, he ended up selling his Ruth's Chris Steakhouses. He was the second biggest franchisee in the world of yeah. Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. He ended up selling those restaurants back to Ruth's Chris I want to dissect all this stuff. Just get yeah. super high level for yeah. me real quick. So, what was after um, Ling Lewis? Uh, I went to a local concept here called Sumo Maya. Okay. Uh, it's kind of one of those really hip, cool places, uh, almost Vegas-like, you know, big nightlife. Really high end food, super delicious. And that was 2018 to. That was 2018, and you know, right, basically right after I finished training at Sumo Maya as the general manager, uh, Randy, the owner of Ling and Louis, came back to me and, and proposed that he sell the company to me. Okay, so <laughs> got it. <laughs> got it. We're gonna now we're gonna get in our helicopter and hover all over it. Yep. We were just cruising at 30,000 feet in our jet, but like back to. Um, 2006 mm -hmm. or 2001 to 2006 uh, is where the where you said you grew the most yes with the bamboo globe um, dive into that evolution the reflecting back who you were the manager were you were then what were the biggest challenges and okay. so I, I think there were a couple because I, I went from uh, being that young kid running seasons that really didn't know anything. Right. Right. And I got thrust into this concept that was just purchased by a larger company set for national expansion. And I remember one of my first days of training, <laughs> I was I was there and I was like helping bust the table and we were on a, you know, an hour and 30 minute wait. And, you know, I was just kind of moving at the pace that I did at the other restaurant before. And the the training manager basically said, Hurry the fuck up. You know? <laughs> like, what? what? Message received. Yeah. It's like, we're not, we're not here to dilly-dally, like, get going. I'm like, oh, okay. So that right there let me know I was on a completely different plane, right? right. You know, not just from intensity, but pace and expectations. Yes. Yeah. Culture isn't what is written on the paper. It's what's happening every day. Absolutely. And you need those culture carriers. You yep. need those people who know the standards and who are willing to enforce them. Your enforcers, your yep. culture carriers. Uh, and that was this guy who told you, or maybe it was a lady? No, it was a guy. It was a guy. He told uh, you to hurry the fuck up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Al Alvarez, he was a, a big mentor for me uh, and, and really took me under his wing at the time and showed me the ropes of what, what management and leadership was and then, like this is early 2000s so leadership then in restaurants very different than what it is now okay right you can't really tell people to hurry the fuck up now right, right? like right. that that doesn't get digested very well i think it depends how you say it right <laughs> if you do it with a smile on your face means a lot right yeah um <laughs> you know but it, like again it, you know i didn't take offense to it i just said it was a realization like yeah gotta step it up yeah um, so that at Bamboo Club, going from a manager and then trying to become a GM uh, was was a struggle, right? Because I wa I came in thinking I knew a lot, realizing right. that I didn't. Um, Before you get into that, he 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 taught you what leadership and management was. Mm -hmm. Paint the picture of what that was. Um, I think for them it was a lot of procedures. It was processes. Uh, and even, you know, looking back from a front of house perspective, they had a lot of the processes, the checklists, all that kind of stuff in motion. The back of the house, not so much. I think they were trying to go from, uh, you know, because it was a, a, a Korean chef that was a lot of the measurements were a scoop of this and a scoop of that. Right. Maybe written on a piece of paper. Cook to taste. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to to actually having recipes so they could grow and expand right right, right. Um, so from the checklist side though or front of house it was very specific right I, I remember coming in I would close the night before I'd come in and if you if you did it right the opening manager would put a check next to it and if you didn't do it right a big circle right so the first thing you do is you come in later that afternoon right you're looking to see how you did and it's circle 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 you're like what are you kidding me like I stayed here an extra hour to try to make sure it was perfect, and they're like, you know, it was in the the silverware in the the silverware bin wasn't all facing the same direction. And I'm like, you'd be kidding me, really? Like you're gonna mark me off because one fork was there? Right. But that that was the 
the expectation. Standards are standards. Yes. There's no close enough. It's like, this is how we do yeah. it. And you, you hear things like, you started when I asked you, like, what is the, the leadership and what did that look like? Mm-hmm. You, when you think of words like leadership, you don't think about, like, you went straight to systems and processes. Yeah. And I think people disconnect the two. But the reality is, I feel like leadership is the discipline to do the damn thing right yes. every time. Yes. And that, that is, finish my train of thought. Yeah. And that's, that's, I had to realize, like, I can't take it personally. Right, she's not attacking me. She's attacking the, the fact that it, yeah, the standard wasn't upheld. Right, right. So it was a lot of learning that. Mm. Right, and again, back in that in those days, it was if your leadership wasn't talking to you, you were doing good. Mm. Right, it was it was a lot, and I don't know. Maybe that was just kind of the culture of the company, um, but you know, as I evolved, you know, we went and opened another store down in Tempe on Mill Avenue and it's the the my training manager Al was now kind of a regional manager he would come in and all of us that were doing our jobs would you would see everyone like flock to him and say hey what's up how you doing catch up with him right and then all the people that were kind of call them hide and seekers they act like they're do, doing the right thing but they're they're really not right they'd all disperse like cockroaches when the lights come up. Like, oh, I got to get away from him because he's going to call me out for doing something, right? Yeah. So um, so that, that was, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of that and just learning that, you know, trying to yeah. uphold the, the standards and everything. And then- This sounds very on par for 01 to 06 restaurant operations where right? it's like, <laughs> like militant. Uh, and leading by correcting, but not necessarily like the, the like this is like where like I think the one minute manager book was like really on fire, which yes. was like the next step of of don't only speak to people when they're doing something wrong, but be f- be sure to reinforce yes. when they're doing the right thing. Yeah, and, and it, uh, I think there's in that time there was never a why; it was just this is how it is. And now we're in a time where we are trying to explain why we're doing things. Right? Mm-hmm. We have these steps. Uh, you know, we call them our, our hospital or our steps of hospitality, right? Our hospitality sequence. We have these, and we're explaining why these steps are important, right? And because we want everyone to understand that it's not just about us making a, an extra buck as a restaurant, but it's about how you create an experience for the guest, how you get them to want to come back, how you yeah. get them to ask for you. The subtleties, the little details, yep. the things that are unconscious yes. that are happening to you, like having every. By the way. Your, yep. your dining room was immaculate when I showed up today. <laughs> every every plate, perfectly spaced, like the, symmetrical across the boards, like all the details. You're, you're walking the walk right now from all the stuff that you just Thank talked you. about. Yeah, See, and sure. uh, to me, I, I don't know if guests ever consciously notice that. No. But subconsciously, right? And we I've always said this. Subconsciously, they walk in and they just know that the place has their shit together. Yeah. Right? And that, to me, is, is of the utmost importance. Yeah. We have to interrupt today's episode to let you know that every second and fourth Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, Restaurant Systems Pro CEO Fred Langley is going live to teach you everything you need to know to run a profitable restaurant from soup to nuts. All you got to do is click the link below. Earlier, you mentioned that it was a hard struggle for you to go from GM from from uh, I think you were eight. What was the role that you were explaining? To so us I was a um, a manager, and I got passed up a couple times for the next GM spot. Okay, which I took very personally. Did they tell you why? No. Okay. No, uh, I think you know I was young, um, you know, and I was trying to, uh, in my mind, just egotistically, I wanted to be the youngest GM in the company. How old are you at this point? Twenty three. Twenty. I think I was twenty three at this okay. point, and I think I finally become a GM when I turned twenty four. Right. Um. So I just missed it, right? Still pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, not bad, right? <laughs> um, but th- like, never really given a reason. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it was what it was, and yeah. I, I so soldiered tw- on. And so, twenty four, you get the opportunity. I get the opportunity. You said it was a struggle. What <laughs> was the struggle? Because I walked in, so I went to a a new location. So at this time, we had three locations here in the Phoenix metropolitan area, and one in Tucson. Um, the the one that I went to was the second oldest location, right? So it had a lot of veteran people that had been there for several years, kind of set in their ways. And it was run by uh, a GM that was super numbers oriented, 
Like he wasn't necessarily experience driven, right? He wasn't guest focused. It was, I have to penny pinch every line on our P&L and that's how he, he was going to get ahead, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, in hindsight, that's what was expected of him, yeah. right? Where, where I was coming from was guest first. Mm. So, this, so this all ties together because not only am I becoming a GM, but now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was a, a small local company of two restaurants that was purchased by a bigger company set for national expansion. So now it's purchased by this bigger company that is very numbers focused. Yeah. So it sounds like you are a qualitative leader, not a quantitative leader. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so it was going in thinking I was hot shit, thinking I knew everything, and walking in knowing and, and realizing very quickly that I didn't. Regarding right? the details. Regarding how to be a general manager. Okay. What right. Were you I missing. Had, buy in from the team. I think yeah. it was the biggest thing, right? Because I walked in with a ego, and I think the team just kind of looked at me like, "Who the hell is this guy?" Yeah. Like, who do you who do you think you are coming in telling us who have been running this restaurant, doing this, the Bamboo Club, longer than you've even been with the company? Right. Right. And you know, I think it it, it turned some people off. Was there a tipping point? Um. Yes. Uh, well, a little bit. I think we we had some turnover, which was you know expected um but i think the biggest tipping point for me um so at this point i had we had just had our my wife and i had just had our first kid and uh young yeah yeah um that's a whole nother podcast (laughs) (laughs) um and uh marketing corporate put down this big promotion and it was it was one of those where marketing doesn't really consult with operations and operations just has to figure it out. And we dropped the ball big time. And it was one night we ran out of everything. We ran out of chicken, ran out of beef, ran out of anything and everything. And it was a complete disaster of a shift. Everything crashed, hour long ticket times. And I got home and I literally just broke down and, you know, I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, you know, I, suck as a gm right i can't even execute a stupid promotion we're running out of shit I suck as a dad because i'm never here because i'm always at the restaurants i suck as a husband because i'm leaving you here to to fend for yourself and i remember like breaking down crying and she literally just, just kind of stoically just said are you done and i'm like that's what? a keeper right yeah there. i'm like what she's like are you done i'm like I, uh, apparently, yeah, yes. She's like, look, do you know what you need to do? I'm like, well, yeah. She's like, well, then go fucking do it. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, you're right. I need to go do this. Right. Right? So it was it was that I, I think I needed someone to just kick me in my ass. Did right? you because like I was marry just some Zen leader by any chance? <laughs> no, but she's 100% Egyptian and she's a spark plug. Oh, man. Right? So, uh, and, and she's always been my number one fan. So... Every step of the way, she's been there to support and, right. and you know, give me that little kick in the ass that I need it. When I hear advice that comes up in, this, in the podcast that's relative to a book that I just recently read, it's hard for me to not bring it up. Mm-hmm. But uh, just recently, while driving out west, listened to The Power of Now. Um, and that's exactly the message is, like, thinking about all the things you could have done or you should have done or the future and like, do I really want to do this? Or like the, the fear of, am I doing the right thing? All the, all those things that these emotional things that are happening internally, Mm -hmm. quiet them. You have no control over the past. Yep. You have no control. Like you can't, I mean, there's, you could argue that you can create a future, Mm -hmm. but you can't do anything about the future in the future. You can only do something about the future now. Right now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And live in the now and just, get to work yep and that's such a powerful message yeah and th- and that's exactly what she told me and i got up from from my seat and i called the the gm of one of the other locations i said hey we're out of chicken can i come down and grab some chicken for you or grab whatever products we need so we can operate tomorrow and blah 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 and and then i just kind of never looked back from that point from that point i, I knew all right again different level different expectation how are we going to do this 
and how can I be successful? So, so you, yeah, go ahead. So I, I think it, it led enough growth for myself, or I grew enough in that time that they asked me to be the GM of one of the new, newer locations that had just opened up that was twice as big. And, um, so I went up there and up there, where is this? Uh, it's here in Phoenix, Got Desert Ridge marketplace. Got it. Uh, but it was a two story, big, beautiful building, you know, hand painted murals, and, uh, just a really, really killer spot. So and, what was the next struggle? Um, that one wasn't, I don't, I don't think that one was as big of a struggle. And I think we got to the point where, you know, it was time for me to move on from that that concept the uh, the bamboo club the bamboo club they five years is a solid run yes right and at that time in my life i thought god i've been here forever right right so, so why did you what was telling you it was time to move on um so the the larger company corporation actually sold off bamboo club okay right and it now it just became its own entity right so they had their seven eight restaurants maybe and i just i don't think I aligned with the leadership anymore, right? And, like, at this point, now we have a second child on the way. And um, my wife actually happened to be working for Kona Grill at the time as a server. And I got contacted by a recruiter for them. And it just seemed like the next logical step for me. What was the disconnect or the – if you weren't aligning with the upper management, what what did they want? What did you want? Um – you know, looking back on it, I don't, I wanted more. I just didn't know how, like, I, I, I was more so familiar what? with that concept. W- more of what? More growth. I don't, okay. there, like, you know, five years is a long time and you become very, very familiar with the concept. Right. Right. And there's a certain point where if the leadership, the ones that are making the decisions, don't really have a vision for growth, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do? Where here? am I going? Right? right. Like, am I just going to be a GM for the rest of my life? Because right. that's I don't. That's not really what I want. Got it. Right. Um, Kona Grill was a company. I think it had just gone public, and it was growing. And I thought that'd be a good fit for me. Right. So, uh, turned out that it wasn't. <laughs> Why wasn't? It? What was the struggle there? So you got hired. Culture. So when right? you. So where was? Where did you enter the Kona Grill? Uh, I entered as. A manager, right? So there was a, a regional manager there that uh, really enjoyed me and I think had bigger plans for me, you know, to eventually move me into a GM spot. And I moved into that GM Wait, spot. Wait, so you were a regional manager and you, and you would, and going up the ladder was being no, no, no. a GM? No, no, no. I was a GM at Bamboo Club. Got it. Moved over to Kona Grill as just a manager, Got right? It. Training. And once I finished training, they moved me into a general manager spot. Got it. Okay. And they moved me into a GM spot at the original location here in Scottsdale at the Fashion Square Mall. Uh, again, another area where long history, a um, lot of veteran staff there. So I got to figure out how to navigate through there. And the, the politicking that came along with that just wasn't what I was really looking for. So like I remember there was a... <laughs> There was one server. This might get me in trouble, but that's okay. Uh, there was one server that had been there for a long time. She was a trainer, uh, corporate trainer, like went to other cities to open stores, whatnot. And she showed up late for a shift. So in that restaurant at the time, there was the front sections, which were the real money makers, And then there were the back sections, which typically were reserved for new servers, whatever. She was late for the shift, so I rearranged the board. And I put her in the back section, Ooh. and she walked in and freaked out and stormed out. And I'm sure she went to corporate and complained about me, but I'm like, you were late. You didn't call. What am I supposed to do? Like, at the very least, I can shut down this section if you don't show up. Right. Right? So what am I supposed to do here? Right. right? You're kind of reminding me of Regan Jasper. I just had him on the show. He came up with a Fox group. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Regan was talking about when he was, when he was getting started, like his, uh, his, his pre-shift or whatever you'd call it, the mm-hmm. um, family meal or like whatever, like going into, some people call it lineup or whatever. Yep. Yep. So um, <clears throat> he was talking about how the way that he would prioritize who gets what sections is he would have everybody line up and then he would, I think he would, 
basically uh, he would ask a question. I mean, I, I, sh- I should probably make sure I know what I'm saying before I start <laughs> saying it. He would ask a question or something along the line, but like it was like a question about like the, the recipes mm-hmm. and whoever did the best, whoever memorized the recipes, the ingredients, whoever did the best would get the best sections. Right. But I think there was one other element to that that I'm, I'm, I'm missing. Whatever. If you're listening to this podcast, it came before this episode. So hopefully you know <laughs> what I'm referencing right now. Uh, anyway, keep going. Yeah. So, um, so trying to navigate that. Um, and then I, I just culturally, you know, I, I think I had gone a lot from, uh, walking the line at bamboo club of guest first experience and numbers, right. And trying to balance those, right. Managing a P and L trying to come in to Kona grill and do the same thing. But there were a lot of people that were so set in their ways that didn't like change. Like I remember I, this was back when everyone started just on their cell phones all the time. Right. Right. And I, I gave a warning. I said, yeah, like, 07, 08. That's yeah. when the iPhone comes yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. It's said, addictive. If it's I, designed to be so. Right. If I catch you on your phone, I'm taking your phone away. Yeah. Sure enough, catch a bartender on his phone, take his phone away. And I get a, <laughs> I have one, it was because my wife had worked there. I was friends with some of the team there. Right. So, and it was actually my wife's old roommate who pulled me aside and said, you got to knock this off. Like, quit being such a hard ass. Like, people really don't like you. And part of me was like, oh, shit. Oh, no, I'm going to lose the staff. But then the other part of me was like, wait, no, this is what the store needs. Right. right? Like, if you, if you guys really want to continue growing and building sales here, we can't just rely on everyone doing what we've done for the past several years. Right. We need to put some, you know, systems and in, in some expectations in place. And yeah. if I tell you what I'm going to do and I don't follow up on it, now I look like a chump. Right. And then that's also the reality of your culture. Yes. You yep. know, culture isn't what, again, it's not what you say you are. It's not what you put on the paper. It's what you do every day. Um, and the point I was trying to make with that server is like, no matter who you are, especially if you're a leader, I think the, the you need to come yeah. down on the, the leader is the hardest right. to show that there's no hierarchy here. And as you climb the ladder, you, you don't get away with things because of your, your, your rank, right? Like flat hierarchy, you know, yep. and you, I think you've got to make an example of the leaders when they don't yeah. show up. And it, like, I feel bad because I never even had the opportunity to explain myself or why that decision was made. Ooh, so you got fired. Well, well, she just stormed off the oh, shift, right? Thought, so, thought, well, but, yeah. but yes, I did end up getting fired. Was it for taking phones away? No, <laughs> no. Um, it was so. When you look at two thousand seven, two thousand eight, we all know what was looming, right? Right. And at that time, Kona Grill was the hot spot, right? It was their happy hour was banging. The place was packed every single night, and it was a lot of financial guys there so as they start getting a whiff of what's coming sales start creeping down and creeping yeah. down and creeping down and unfortunately as the g as the new gm there who takes the brunt of it right, right? and and that's fine right i i accept it I, and i well, think it was the best thing that could have you happened. were leaning towards there wasn't a cultural connection so right like and and i think that's that's what was the hardest thing for me and i i know that now hindsight being 2020 I knew I wasn't happy there. Was it li- was it fired or laid off? No, I was fired. Oh, okay. Definitely fired. <laughs> was there was there like is there a story behind this? Um Are you allowed to talk about it? Is Conan yeah, Grill still a I think I can, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I get so one of the things that they wanted their GMs to do was work Monday through Friday. Yeah. As a father with two young children, and you know, my wife's still in school. That didn't work for me. So, like, I was there on Saturdays and Sundays, right? Because it was easier and better for my family to be off, like, Monday, Tuesday or whatever. Right. Um, so that was kind of – that kind of threw them off. Like, we would have servers that I had trained with at another location that came up on a Saturday or Sunday. They're like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. I'm like, why not? Yeah. Right? Like, s- Saturday's one of our busiest days. Why shouldn't I be here as a GM, right? Um, so there was that. And then I – I uh, I think it was the day after Christmas was like December 26th, which is one of the busiest days in a, a mall, right? Because everyone's going back, returning gifts yeah. and using gift cards and whatever. 
I took that day off because I needed to take that day off, right? Um, I think I actually I think I had a trip planned uh, with my wife just to go to San Diego. Got it. What right? day of the week was that? I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at a calendar, but um, so like that was actually used when they termed me. That was one of the reasons that they termed me. They're like, you weren't here for one of the busiest days of the year, and I'm like. You don't want me here on one of the busiest days of the week. I don't understand yeah. <laughs> what you're trying to say. So, um, again, I just think culturally, you know, me and the, the, the regional manager weren't, you know, we didn't really get along. We didn't see eye to eye. I found out later that, you know, that AGM was feeding him stuff about me. And, you know, just like that, that backstabbing kind of culture, just that's not that's yeah. not me. Right. Like yeah. if you have a problem with me as your GM, come talk to me. Did you grow during this time? Immensely. Did you come out of this a better? I came out operator? of it so much better. How were you better? Uh, because I think I realized the power of culture. Mm. I think the the I realized I was hanging in there for a paycheck because their bonuses were ginormous. Because I got fired before that, I, n- I never got the bonus. But like that's what I was hanging on for, right? And I realized like that's that's not who I am, mm. right? And if I'm going to go somewhere, I need to be me. And I need to be happy with who I am and what I'm doing and the progress that I'm making. Yeah. Did you, so now, from at this point in the story, it's 01 to 08 we've covered, basically. Mm-hmm. Seven years. Yep. Um, had you become more self-aware at this point? Or did that come later in life? Because you're only 25 years old. Yeah. I think at it came, I, at, honestly, I think it came later. Um, okay. And it came while I was with Ling and Louise. Yeah, because you mentioned something earlier that you were a server and a bartender, and you're a horrible that was at terrible. it. And I think some people like there's like this misconception to be a leader, to be a manager, a GM. You're you you climb the ladder because you're the best at what you do. And no. The natural progression, but it's not true. No, yeah. no, right? Like I, I, everything that I'm learning now, as a, a CEO, right, is about right people in the right seat of the bus. Right, right, and. You know, if, even if you have to create a position, if you have someone that is a stud right. that you want to hold on to, even if you have to create a position, right? So we, ha- we have a, a young man here that's been with us for, uh, I think, six years. Um, we have a, a local award show for the hospitality industry called the Foodist Awards. He was just nominated as a finalist for Best Teammate of the Year uh, for that award. Um, and he came to us and he's like, what do you have next for me? And we're like, well, we've been waiting for you to tell us that you want something next, right? So, but he doesn't want full-time management. And so we're literally talking about how to create a role for him in our company, you know, whether it's training or, you know, overseeing the bars, whatever. But, like, you want to develop people like that and grow them because those are the people that are going to really – they're your cheerleaders, right? right. They're, they are proof – Proof's in the pudding, right? We're going to take you from a server and create a career for you. And, again, going back to, to changing the industry, this is this is one of the things that we really want to do is make people realize this isn't just a temporary job. It doesn't have to be a transient job. You can have a full career here. Yep. You can have a great life, right? And let us show you how. Yeah, awesome. Um, so one year with the Kona Grill, Mm-hmm. Um, and then you discover Ling and Louis. Yeah. What was the appeal of Ling and Louis? How did they come on your radar? Uh, so after drinking a lot for a day or two, uh, <laughs> after losing my job, um, started putting my resume out. And the old HR director from Bamboo Club had come over to Desert Island Restaurants, uh, which was the management company for Ling and Louis. Okay. And the minute she saw my resume come through, like I was just looking – Who's hiring, right? I'm just sending off my resume Got wherever it. I can. She saw my name come through, and she called me right away. She's like, you have to come talk to everyone here. Okay. Like, so yeah. you built this reputation for yourself at the Bamboo Grill, mm-hmm. uh, the right culture, the right the, the people that were right for you. She she recognized you and knew that you would have been right for Ling Louie. Yep. All yep. Right. Uh, so, she, so take it from there. Yeah. So uh, I remember I came in. Actually, I think we, I was sitting at this booth. I met how appropriate. Yeah, I met the owner at the time, Randy. Um, kind of chatted with him. It wasn't really an interview; it was more of kind of like shooting the shit, yeah. you know. Um, and that was, sorry, let me step back. I went to the offices. 
did my interview there. Um, gentleman, Chris Ganey, who I still keep in touch with. Uh, he's with SSP right now out of uh, Texas. But he, at the time, he was our director of operations. And I walked in in a suit and all fancy. And I think he, he was, because of my appearance, because I was just a young kid dressed nice, he was ready to blow me off. Um, but I was able to show that I had enough knowledge that it was. he thought it was... Why would you have blown you off for taking it seriously? Though? Um, I think it was, you know, like you, you judge a book by its cover, right? And um, he admitted, like, you know... I, I thought you were going to be stiff. No, yeah. <laughs> no I, I think he just thought I walked in thinking I was the shit, right? Oh, okay. And, Ego. Yeah. And okay. So I think it's one thing to walk in with a suit and to show that, like, you want it and yep. you need it. But when you walk in with a suit and on top of that suit is an ego... Or underneath right. it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had a great conversation with him. He's like, hey, look, Randy's over at the restaurant right now. Why don't you stop by? And I lived right up the street, so I was on my way home. Right. So I stopped by, chatted with him for a little bit, kind of got his vision for what he wanted. Um, and I'd known of him because he had uh, a couple other concepts here in the Valley prior to opening this. Um, so I got the, you know, really where he wanted to take the concept and what he wanted it to be. And I said, okay, cool. I think I can do this. Right. I got the call, got the job and, and started uh, two weeks before we opened this restaurant. What was your starting position? GM? Uh, assistant general manager. Assistant general manager. Yep. Uh, when you were talking, it sounds like you were, you were trying to almost interviewing him. Like what's your vision for the organization? Did I pick up on that correctly? Uh, I, unintentionally. I don't, I don't think I asked that. I think okay. it was, you know, I think as I was up here, I'm sure Chris called him and said, hey, got this kid coming to see you. You talk to him a little bit about it and whatever. And, you know, Chris gave me a little bit of information. So I think it was enough for me to kind of pry and, you know, uh, op- get him to open up a little got bit it. more. Right? So, What was your first impression of him, Luis? Um, I think coming from Bamboo Club and Kona Grill, which were a little bit, up, you know, higher end. Yeah. Uh, I was a little worried that it was going to be too casual for me. Um. But again, like two kids at home and right. wife in school, you know, yeah. got to find something, right? Yeah. And I, th- I just had a really good. And one of the things that I think stood out to me was, you know, he explained his vision of wanting to franchise and not necessarily grow a bunch of corporate stores. And he said, "Well, maybe one day even you could franchise." And I thought, "Oh, yeah, like definitely, because that's yeah. where I want to go eventually." Right. Um, so that gave me that, like, maybe you should give this one a shot Got and it. see how there it was goes. opportunity. Yeah. And that was the, the, ch- the challenge you had before that you feel like you, you hit, you hit a wall. Right. Right. That's why you left, uh, was a bamboo club in the first place. Yep. So, yep. um, okay. So 08, 2008, 10 years yep. with Ling and Louis before you left and then eventually came back only a year later. Yep. But again, the idea of like. What was the evolution for you? Like, what were the challenges with Ling Louie? Um, so the the first challenge was launching the concept. Yeah. Getting us, getting our name out there, and also opening. So where was Ling Louie's when you when you joined? How far into it were they? They were two weeks out from opening. Oh, so wow. like I, actually you you'll see her walking around. Sherry. Yeah. Was my first hire okay. when I came on board, um, and she's been with us since day one. So Is sixteen that her years over your left shoulder right now. Yes. Awesome. Yep. Um, talk about loyalty. Huh? Yeah, and she's so amazing. And like you know, you talk about people that represent your culture and everything you want. That's her. Love it. Um, so it was, you know, opening in the recession, trying to get the word out. Yep. And Did you guys open at eleven. Yeah. I love it. it's a, always a great sign when at eleven the door opens. The door opens. Yeah. The people start. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in the right spot. We Sorry. love it. Yeah. Let's keep going. Keep going. Um, yeah, so just trying to, like, those first two years were rough, right? Like, even though Randy had a great name, and, you know, he had uh, years before just lived right down the road, so yeah. we thought this was the right neighborhood for it. It yeah. was it was, it was was a struggle. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of discounting and programs that were, we were trying to do to bring people in, and it just wasn't yeah. clicking. And uh, Actually, we had uh, one of our, our regular guests who – Bless her soul. She just passed away. Yeah. Um, but she started coming in at that time, and she, over the years, she's always told me, she's like, I never thought you guys were going to make it. Yeah. Like, every time I came in, you guys were 
dead empty. I'm like, I know. But so was look. there a tipping? What was, so was there a tipping point? Bring us to the point where things started to change. You know, we're competing with a table of five women now. Yeah. So <laughs> get right up on that. Okay. Night. So uh, we were probably 2010, 2011 when things started turning around yeah. a little bit, and I think the economy helped yeah. with that. Right, just recovery. Um, but I think we finally kind of found our niche, right? And we went from a concept like we had placemats on the table. That was our menu. Yeah. Like, and it was, you know, very, I, I still remember the first, my first day of training in the kitchen, I cooked this dish and I played it and I go, I can't believe we're only selling this for eleven ninety five. Mm. You gotta be kidding me. Right. Um, so we evolved, we raised some prices and I think we just put a really big focus on hospitality and, getting to know our regulars right. and we had a team that really bought into that so it was andy who was the leader of this randy randy thing randy um, but he wasn't you know he wasn't really in the restaurants okay right like he he you know he had the Ruth's chris steakhouses the macaroni grills that was you know 80 percent of his revenue right, right? So, he, so he came well help me understand who randy was he did the founder of Lingo yes yeah, so uh randy was see he grew up in california Moved over to Hawaii. I think that's where he went to college. Um, and he was with Ruth's Chris Steakhouse way back in the day with Paul Fleming. Like they were, uh, I don't know if they were regional managers, but they were part of Ruth's Chris corporate and, and holding on. Eventually he became a franchisee. He Got bought, it. you know, he, he. I think they originally corporate opened two restaurants in Hawaii. And Randy was helping run those. And he ended up buying those and becoming a franchisee for those. Got it. And then he grew that to six stores right before he he sold it back to corporate back in 2018. Um, in between all of that, how long did it take him to go from zero to six stores? Twenty years, okay. maybe. I mean, he he had five stores for a long as long as I had been with the yeah. company. He had had five stores, uh, and then they opened a sixth right before they sold it. Got it. Um, but in between that, he also brought uh, Roy's Pacific Rim Cuisine from Hawaii to the mainland. Got it. So uh, I don't know if it was a license agreement or a franchise agreement, however it was, but he brought Roy's, which later got bought out by Outback Steakhouse. Um, so he had one here in, in Scottsdale. He had a couple in California. Uh, so once he had to sell those, he's like, well, what am I going to do? So we opened a, a another concept called Typhoon Taste of Asia, which was very similar to a P.F. Chang's, but more Southeast Asian, more tropical, exotic flavors, which was probably a little bit ahead of the curve, right? And it was nominated for Nation's Restaurant uh, Hottest Concept Award. Um, I think it won Hottest Concept this Award. This all before opening Ling & Louis. All before opening Ling & okay. Louis. Um, but the one thing that he realized with Typhoon... And this was, you know, oh, somewhere like 04 to 06, right? If you had a group of four and one person was a steak and potatoes person, they weren't coming to Typhoon. Right. Right. So they, they slowly started evolving the menu to be a little bit more Americanized, yeah. you know. Um, and then, you know, one of them closed, another one closed, like just for one reason or another. And I think he realized, like... Screw it. I'm, I'm, I've lived my whole life in Hawaii. I've seen how Asian and American cultures get along beautifully. Right. Let's, let's really lean into this Americanization. right? So we worked with a marketing firm out here, um, came up with the, the name Ling and Louie's, whole backstory of it. Like There's a whole fictional story of, of these two characters <laughs> that represent the kind of the wacky menu where you have orange chicken next to meatloaf on a menu, right? Um, so I think that that was really his vision. So now, if you're a meat and potatoes guy, you Something have meatloaf. Yeah, you have meatloaf. You have sliders. You have, you know, we had a great fried chicken sandwich on the menu, right? So um, that evolution for us to really find out who we were as a brand for Ling and Louis, I think it took those two or three years. Got it. Before, and that's once we said this is who we are. Right. And we leaned into it. That's when business started picking up. And it sounds like he was pretty well established. Yes. So, so he had what a lot of, I mean, if, it, if this was his first restaurant 
and like he didn't have the operating capital behind him or other cash flow coming in from those other businesses, mm-hmm. like he probably wouldn't have had the the privilege of having a three year runaway right. to figure it out. Right. And trust and, me, like uh, there were times where he'd call us into his office and he'd ream us like we are not profitable. I'm losing money on this. What are we doing? And you know, we're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, like we had no answers, right? We're like, we're just thinking, oh, we're operating really well. Like, well, originally the reason why I wanted to learn more about Randy was because I was wondering if he went from you know straight out of college to operating franchises and just being the guy, a manager. A man- like, so, so when he you was- go into a, a franchise, you're managing systems and people, right? right? You're not doing menu engineering. You're not really creating a concept from scratch. You're not really right. doing market research. You're taking the thing. And you're you're executing it, right? Right. Yep. And but, well, so I think he, but he did have experience opening other concepts. He did. Yeah. He had. He had so a couple that's why other I wanted concepts. To learn more. Yeah. Um, and I think if we could go back in time, I think we would do a lot more cross utilization of stuff. And you know, and you know, there's franchise agreements and that kind of stuff, and it's proprietary information. But there were a lot of things that we could have learned managing Ling and Louis from. Even just reading the operating manual from what do you Risk mean Chris. by cross utilization using the systems and processes? Right, but he was afraid to use those systems and processes. I don't. Because of I don't know if he was afraid, but there wasn't. There wasn't a lot of crossing crossover between brands, right? So in terms of the way the businesses were run, correct? Yeah, he kept them very separate. He had a operating a director of operations for Ruth's Chris. Um, you know, he had his guys for Macaroni Grill, and then he had his guys for Ling and Louis, and you know. I, whether that was right or wrong, I don't know. I mean, I think it worked out okay for him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't get to talk to people like Randy who, I mean, sometimes I, I love the idea of diversifying your portfolio. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying different types of, con- like different brands. I'm talking about different types of restaurant models. Right. So either having a one-off um, your one-off brand that maybe you might scale at two or three locations and then you have a you know a Ruth's Chris franchise and then mm-hmm. you might do like an In-N-Out burger I don't think you can do an In-N-Out burger they're pretty tight over there but like right. you know what I'm saying like yeah. a franchise burger concept and yep. like really diversifying that portfolio um, so it's tough and it you know I think when you're a franchisee like I said earlier like he was a he was a really good franchisee right he ran his restaurants his restaurants were typically more profitable than the corporate restaurants, you know, they, he just the execution was better, the service was better. Uh, you know, we'd go to a Ruth's Chris out there in Hawaii when visiting, and like everything was outstanding. Even even if we weren't, I don't like a work capacity. Like my wife and I would just go in because we have family out there, right? Um, everything top notch. You come here to a Ruth's Chris, and eh, you know. Well, there's was, there's the far better steakhouses. I was curious about too. That kind of struck me as odd is how much he spread himself out. Mm-hmm. Like having like Hawaii is in a close flight. What is that? I, so I I think he twelve hours. No, uh, it's a like a six hours? hour flight. Oh really? Yeah. From here to Hawaii. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not I'm bad. from the West Coast, so yeah. or the East Coast. So I always feel yeah. Like no, it's, it's not bad. But I I I think you know I think he had, I don't know if his wife they had settled here. Something brought them here, right? So he bounced back and forth between the two, right? And right. that's what—that's where they came up with the the name Desert Island Restaurants, right? So going from the desert to the islands. Got it. Um, but like I know his kids were raised out here. They went to high school here. Um, they would go back for the summer, you know. And that—that's really busy season in Hawaii. So yeah. he was there for the busy season. Um, and I think he surrounded himself with really good people, right? Like he—he he knew I can't run this company bouncing from restaurant to restaurant i need people within the restaurants yep. that are taking care of it and uh people that i can trust yeah so this this first three years of like really three year runaway mm-hmm. uh take us go into that and really talk about the evolution of Ling louis during this period to where you got traction like what was it that started the change what, what did you start doing differently that started bringing people in um Again, I think it was really us identifying who we were and being able to explain who we were, right? Okay. Like, uh, as as much as we don't necessarily like giving our team a script, uh, I think we've we evolved it to a point where you have to be able to describe what our concept is because it's not every day you walk in and see a pad thai and a meatloaf, right? Right. So, what the hell does this mean? Right. Right. And. If you go back to like our earliest reviews on Yelp or whatever, it was always 
that was the worst Chinese restaurant I've ever been to. Uh, it's like, well, yeah, because we're not a Chinese restaurant. Right. That's not who we are. Right. We're Asian fusion, right? And we came up with our own name, modern, modern Asian cuisine with American flair yeah. to represent that. So I think once we got the team to really lean into that and explain that to the guests, it became much easier, right? And guests started realizing, oh, okay, we get it. Uh, and I also think in that, that time frame, even though we had some, the recipes that we had taken from that typhoon concept and brought over here, really f- nailing it down to be great uh, and to be exactly what we wanted it to be, it right. took that, that much time. Well, I was also kind of curious, too. Another reason why I wanted you to get into who Randy was was as a franchisee, are you really getting into menu engineering and pricing out? the items to know how to, to earn a profit or are you just doing what corporate tells you? No, I, I think, you know, even for us as a franchisor, we, they, we give them the recipes, they cost it out. They tell us what they want their pricing to be. Okay. So as a franchisee, we don't really control or we, as a franchisee, you have control of the pricing. Okay. Right. So like as a, in Ruth's Chris, you got shipping from, you know, here in, on the mainland. So he was doing cost, cost Yeah, so cars, he was doing costing, all, all that, that kind stuff. of stuff. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. So, I mean, so you identified that like he was giving food away. Like it seemed like it, it felt like you, he was giving, giving food away. No, no. I think we were, it was just the research and development to make sure okay. that we were doing it right. And this was exactly what we wanted. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, we had played around with chalkboard specials and this and that. And uh, we certainly had the 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 mindset of, you're a first time guest. Let's give you a sample of our frozen Thai Mai. Let's give you a little sample of this just to whet your appetite and, and make you really think, Oh, this place is special. They care that it's my first time, right? They want yeah. me to, to really understand and, and feel at home. Got it. So. I do think the one thing I do love about Randy's approach, and I'd recommend this to anybody, like the first restaurant you open, don't have it be your dream restaurant mm-hmm. because y- your dream restaurant for many, I mean, unless your dream restaurant is a money machine, most people's, my experience, most people's dream restaurant is an extension of their passion and this this idea, this idea they want to do. Yes. Right? It's yep. not, it's like, oh, like, I want to do this. I want to do high touch. I want to have a, a new uh, menu every day and, like, all this stuff that's just, like, such a hungry monster. <laughs> and uh, Way you, too hard. <laughs> yeah, so hard. Um, and, you know, it's going to take everything you have. Yep. Um, and it's going to be expensive. You know, yeah. so creating something that's scalable from day one and getting to the point where you and, and scalable meaning you don't need to be there to do it. Right. Or like do one thing really well, put systems and processes behind it and just and just knock it out of the park and get that that 25 percent profit margin concept and scale it. Right. right. And then once you built the team around it and, and the systems and processes are clear, you can remove yourself to then create the dream concept. Right. The thing you've always wanted to do because you have this cash cow on the back end supporting it for three years until yep. you figure out how to make it profitable. Yep. Right. Yep. So another way to do that is to buy into a cash cow. Right. To become a franchisee and to swallow your pride a little bit. And that's one of the reasons why I love these diversified portfolios. Mm-hmm. Go in, become a franchisee, and kick the shit out of it and then have like scale that, have your cash flow, and then say, okay, I've, I've spent five to ten years executing somebody else's vision and processes and yep. procedures and all this. Now I have a clue, and I can take all those lessons and put it into my vision. Right. What's, what's going through your mind? No, I think that's that's one hundred percent right. But you know, I think the the toughest part is fighting that entrepreneurial spirit, right? As a franchisee, you know, there were certainly things that we did in our Ruth's Chris steakhouses that they weren't doing at Ruth's Chris corporate. And they, you know, they gave us some leeway. Right. And I think as a franchisor, even for us, we give our franchisees some leeway here and there. Right. So like our, our two restaurants in Idaho, our franchise partners there, they have a full sushi bar. Right. And it was something that the, the franchisee was very, very adamant about. And he thought it was something that could help them turn the tide and, and drive more business in. And it absolutely works. Yeah. Right. You guys have sushi here? We do. It's a very limited I saw menu. the soy um, yep. carafe or whatever you call it, yep. container. Yeah. We do very limited menu. Um, you know, I think it's six rolls, something Got like it. that. But it's it's diversified the menu a little bit. Got so. it. Um, okay. So let's let's continue along this vein of evolution and growth. Um, 
so three years. We, we cover the first three years. How are you growing during this time? We, didn't, we um, talked about the concept, but we, we weren't really talking about you. So a lot of it was being having the uh, ability, or for Randy saying, do the bar. Make the bar program special. Be cutting edge. Right? So that helped me kind of dig in and research and, and, you know, and this is all the same time as the big cocktail revolution right. that was happening, right? So to really try to be cutting edge with our bar program. I see some of these bar programs now, and I'm just like, oh. Yeah. Like, this is, like, intimidating. Yes. You so know, it's, it's crazy what they're doing today. It's being cutting edge enough to be on trend, but simplifying it enough to make it scalable yeah and scalable right so um you know we have uh, we always joke around but like idaho is a few years behind where we're at right and we're a few years behind the coast like california new york san francisco right so how do we take what's trending over there on the coasts incorporate it and make it unique enough to arizona or to, to our concept and also be appealing to people in Idaho. Right. Right. So that's that's been a, a big challenge. Yeah. I will say the gap between California and the Boise's of the world is getting much shorter. Much smaller. You know, yeah. and social media and, and just digital presence right. is is totally helping that. Yeah, and um, there's there's people in Dayton, Ohio looking at Instagram photos mm-hmm. from things coming out of Miami. Yep. And they want it. Right. And and if you can bring that to Dayton, Ohio, or to Boise, Idaho, uh, these these momentum markets, I think there's so much opportunity there because Absolutely. the desire is, is there, and yep. it's hard to get that stuff. So don't be afraid to take a risk on these markets, right? Because it might not be as big of a market share, but that's also changing because more and more people are taking their remote jobs and taking their New York New York City paycheck. And bringing it to a Boise, Idaho, oh, working yeah. remotely, and they want, they have the money to burn because yep. they're saving the money on the lifestyle. They, they have the money to burn, and they have the experience of these California restaurants, right? Right. right. Where the world's like, shrinking. Yeah. People are getting around, yep. moving around more than ever yep. before. And um, it's it's been the the nice thing about being in a smaller market like that is we're a big fish up there in a smaller pond. Yeah. Right. So they they opened their second restaurant just you know the summer of last year. It's a great fanfare because the demand was there. Yeah. Let's go back to the point that you made, creating a bar program mm-hmm. that was um, cutting edge but also scalable. Yep. So in terms of scalability, break down what you mean by that. So I think it, again, takes some time to learn these things. I, I look at some of our, our early recipes and just very cringeworthy. I'm like, I can't believe I thought about doing a, a cocktail like that, right? Um, now it's to the point where we want to – we basically want to make pouring a cocktail as fast and simple as possible but maintain the flavors of a craft cocktail yeah right so uh, and this is kind of a a trend nationwide worldwide really where you're prepping all the all the 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 mixology stuff is on the prep side and then building it behind the bar to order yeah. is super easy, super fast. So batch cocktails. Yep. So we're batching. Are you? Are they on draft? Uh, no, we did try the draft. It wasn't really working on our system. Uh, I think when we do another restaurant, we'll probably go back to that. Yeah. Um, but we so we have a, our frozen Thai Mai, our, our twist on a Mai Tai. Yeah. Four different rums in there. It's frozen, so we have a machine back there. So we batch it all together, pour it in, and then it's literally pulling a lever. Yeah. Recently had Nick Kosovich on the show, and um, he got into like there was a period where the flair bartending was like hot mm-hmm. because like it was the that was the experience. Yep. was going and seeing all that happening. You know, it was like wow, this is cool. And like, but the point he made is like, listen, people aren't taking a photo of the guy shaking the drink. Right, like that's only cool for so long. What they take the photo of is the finish the finished project product. So yep. it's about throughput. <laughs> Being able to get the drink to the customer and then just putting the energy not into making the drink but to garnishing the drink. Yeah. And to making it look visually appealing because that's what's going to get the photo. That's, that's what's 100% gonna, it. Yeah. And if I have to wait 15 minutes for a drink, why am I going to order another yeah. one? Right. right. So exactly. you want to be able to turn and burn. So we, like, we even, our old fashions are actually served in a flask. Yeah. 
So that's already pre-batched, and then cool. we pour it over. You know, pour it over a nice big piece of ice at the yeah. table. It's amazing how many how much more money you can make when you just make drinks appear out of thin right. Air. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. Um, so okay, so along this evolution, um, you're so like when take me to the point where you start kind of figuring out who you are, what your lean is, what your strengths are, because you're still a young guy. I mean, you're not even in thirty years old in two thousand eight. You're yeah. what twenty six, twenty. 27. 27. Yep. So this is around the time for men that your frontal lobe starts to, to finally round off. Yeah. And you do become more self-aware. So as you're, you know, working with Lena and Louis, how are you becoming more self-aware and, and also hit on any other struggles along the way? Yeah. So we, all of our managers went through a, a predictive index, uh, PI, right? And was I took this it. recently? No, no. This was when I got hired. Wow. But it wasn't until, like, three years later that actually someone 2008 yeah i think it was do you know i had pi on the show right yeah 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 Yeah, i mean they were randy was way ahead of the curve yeah no he was all over it and he had um his cfo at the time and his director of operations in hawaii were trained on how to read the predictive indexes wow super i mean i kind of thought maybe randy might have been a chump but i'm totally wrong no no he's again like just as a mentor for me um as a visionary, you know, I think he did a lot of things right. Right. And it, it just, at the end of the day, I think franchising, I think we bit off more than we could chew at the time. So that, and that's, we can get into some of those, yeah, those mistakes. Get and, into PI. Cause I'm a, I'm a fanboy of this type of stuff, but get into, yeah. so he, he invested in PI. Yep. He had his team members become borderline, Subject matter. Ex- yep. I won't say experts because it's a lot. No, it's a lot were, to process. They were right? able to read it. Yeah, and understand that, enough to, to read it and explain it and understand how to manage the team based off of it. So, right? what is PI? Get into the just start uh, there and then get into how you guys rolled it out. So it's been uh, it's been a while. So predictive index. They give you two groups of words, right? And you pick the words. Um, I think this. I also just did one called culture index, which is very similar. Um, but you, it's a group of words, and you pick the ones of who you who you are. Right. Right. And then another one of who you think you should be in your role. Right. So right? it's what you what you think you res what you resonate with and what the expectation is. Right. Think, yes. Right? Yep. Yep. So you go through that and then it comes up with this chart and you're you know, there's four personality points basically and you're on this this chart and I took the, the test but never got any feedback on it, right? Really? And then finally the CFO came in and gave me the feedback and he's like and he broke it down for me. He goes, look, you are extremely detail-oriented. Uh, almost so much so no that... No way. Yeah. Put your phone away. <laughs> Mr. Put your phone away. Right. Uh, almost so much to where you have trouble completing tasks, right? Because you get very distracted. Hyper-focus. Right. Um, and he, he... Wait, you said distracted and I said hyper-focus. Which one is it? Distracted. Okay. Right. Well, I could be focused on one thing and then something else that is not in order will pull you off. Will pull me off of what the task that I was doing because okay. I want to fix that right away. Got it. <laughs> so it's it's like a kind of both, I got guess. It, got but it. um So he comes in, he says you're 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 hyper you're like you're detail oriented, yep. but you get distracted easily. But it's it, it could be an issue to where you don't complete your tasks, got right? It. So that's that's when I start really analyzing how I work, how I manage, who right. I am. Did he ever go over the results with you? He did, yeah, okay. he did. And, and what are you? Like that, I don't remember the exactly what it was, and even even the culture index that I just did, um, I don't remember the the word. The word. I'm a promoter for the record. Okay. I took. The I can see that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who would have um, thought? Right. <laughs> um, but it was it, so. The one thing that the culture index has that I don't know the predictive index has is a measurement of how long you can function under the expectations compared to your who you really are. Um, so like I have the bandwidth to operate outside of my norm, out of my comfort zone for longer than most people. I al- it also measures this, your creativity or your ingenuity side. And for someone like me who is very detail oriented, it's not common to be creative. Right, but I have this really strong creative side too. Yeah, and they had you heading the, the bar program. So, <laughs> yeah, so. This, this uh, is why it's so important to do, the, to, to invest in right. understanding who your people are. Yep. 
so you can put them on the in the right seat on yeah. the bus. Because would they have done that if they had known that you're not a creative person? Probably I don't, not. I, probably not. I don't know. Uh, you know. So, um, excuse me. Yeah. So just uh, that's really where I I started, I guess, analyzing, overanalyzing who I am, why I make decisions, why I behave certain ways. Right. Um, you know, I'm not a um, I'm not that strong A personality where you're you're kind of loud and boisterous and um, trying I'm, to steer the ship. Yeah, I'm more of a refrained, very even keel. Um, you know, if it comes to confrontation, I'm probably more of a smart ass than I am a direct. Uh, and that's something that I'm working on because um, I find that being more direct, you know, direct with politeness gets far more done than being a smart ass sometimes, yeah, you know, honey, especially in the role that I'm in. Honey goes a lot further than, what's the expression? Honey's better, sweeter than, I can't remember yeah. the expression. <laughs> but, um, you track more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Something, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, so any any thoughts to round off PI and the significance? I mean, are you still using PI or is that something that you're uh, It's something we're looking into. We're, 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 or that or culture index, you know, okay. again, they're very, very similar. Um, the person here that, I was introduced to Culture Index through my, my peer group uh, in a group uh, with some other CEOs here in the Valley. And uh, I'm not familiar with Culture. That's the first time it's been mentioned, so I'll have to look into yeah. it. But I, I do have a relationship with PI in the sense that I, I've had the founder on the show. Um, I'll try to link to it. Um, even his name is escaping me right now, though. I talked to way too many people. Yeah. Uh, I just do Restaurant Stoppable uh, PI. Mm -hmm. index and um to, to learn more about that if you're interested yep uh, and i also had ed doherty on the show who's a predictive index a certified expert who goes and, and does the exercises with restaurants yeah and and ed is willing to do a free reading with you so if you're interested in pi uh email me eric at restaurant and i will connect you with ed doherty because even if you just do it for yourself it's so powerful to, mm -hmm. to get to understand to become more self-aware yep even if you don't follow through to work with PI, like and Fred's or Fred, Ed's gonna hate me. <laughs> Still selfishly like leverage that because yeah. it's gonna help you so much become a better leader. Yep. And it, again, it also helps you understand your management teams, yeah. right? So knowing who they are, if they're the right in the right position, right, is oh so important, right? Because right. when you when you have leaders and you have these specific expectations, right, if they don't fit the mold, you gotta play to their strengths, right? And like it's it's again it's getting the right people on your bus and putting them in the right seats. Yep. The more data you have on them, the more you know what the right seat looks like. Absolutely. For that person. Uh, in uh, Ed Doherty, his business is called uh, One Degree. If you just want to go straight to Ed and just tell him about Restaurant Stoppable, mm -hmm. and uh, he'll take care of you guys. Yep. Um, so you brought this whole thing up. So you you had this your manager do the PI. Take it from there. Yeah. So you know we went through. He gave me the the feedback and I said, oh, okay, great. And, and, like, it also gave me some direction on what I needed to work on, right? So, um, what did you need to work on? What were your struggles? Uh, I think it was... We, we kind of identified the hyper-focus. Yeah, I think that, that was... around on the details. I think that was it. And just, I think, leaning more into relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things... I remember a couple of years into managing here, I told my wife, I go, I don't think I ever want to go back to managing a big restaurant, right? This is, you know, we're 2,900 square feet here. And it's very easy to be intimate with your guests. And I was able to build really lifelong relationships with a lot of our guests over the years that, you know, I, I don't, if I hadn't had that feedback from the predictive index, I don't think I would have leaned into those. Mm. Right? Self-awareness, man. It's yeah, powerful. It is. Like, and it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard getting out there and, you know, when you're a little bit more introverted like I am to go in and just be on stage all the time and, right. and be that, that face of the brand right. and shaking hands and kissing babies. Like sometimes that's exhausting. Oh, oh yeah. Um, but I was able to push myself because it wasn't, I'm not, I'd looked at it less of being on stage and more of, you know, one-on-one -on -one building relationships and driving that home and making that one individual feel really right. special. Yeah, the power of that self-awareness is almost like, it's very similar to like, taking the time to put your core values down on paper. Yes. Right? Yep. So when you put your core values down on paper, it becomes a filter for everything that you do for your business. Mm -hmm. But PI is almost like, a, or any kind of behavioral analysis, is kind of like a, a filter for what am I supposed to be doing and yep. how do I reverse engineer my business to serve my strengths right. and to and, make me happy. 
And I think yeah. it also helps you understand where you feel your expectations are. And sometimes you can, like, if you, so if, if I have one of my managers take the, the PI and they, they have these expectations that don't actually fall in line with what our expectations are, it helps us kind of reset that and say, look, you think this is what you're supposed to be doing, right? But this is what we actually accept, expect of you. Got it. Right. So it, it, it's kind of twofold. Yeah. It helps you communicate better. Mm -hmm. And there's also different ways that different types of people prefer to be communicated to. Right. So understanding this, one, helps you understand their strengths. Two, helps you understand how to talk to them. Yes. It's a very powerful process. Yep. It, it helps you learn who you can tell to hurry the fuck up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And other people <laughs> so. who you might be like, hey, how are you doing today? Yeah. Like, are you yep. okay? Yep. Are you okay? I just noticed that maybe, like, I just want to make sure you're good. Yeah, you seem a yeah. little off. Everything okay, good? You good? Hurry the fuck up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, let's continue down this path of your evolution. So, mm -hmm. eventually, I mean, we haven't, you are the owner of Lena Louise today. Yes. So, we haven't even gotten there yet. Yeah. We're an hour and 22 minutes into the oh my conversation. Goodness. It goes by so fast. Yeah. Some people are like, oh, man, two hours is a long time. I'm like, yeah, but how much gold just came out of that conversation? Because right. I took the time to sit. And also, how long does typically a table last? About an hour and a half? Hour and a half. Sometimes two hours yeah. if it's a really great night. Yep. Yeah. I'm not looking to have a 30-minute meal with somebody. Exactly. Yep. You know, like, that's the way I, like, you, you want an experience. Yeah. I yep. want to I wanna get to, I want to have an intimate meal with you, man. Yep. And this has been great. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you. To really go through. So, um, yeah, the, continue along this vein of, so I think where we've been, um, Three years in, you're starting to be profitable. Uh, you took the time to really kind of commute. You said the solution was taking the time to communicate to the consumer who you are, and the consumer became familiar with who mm -hmm. you are. You got you better understood what you were delivering and communicating that. Right. Um, you started um, thinking about scalability and creating a concept that was scalable. Uh, you, the, you did mention something about the franchise, the world yes. of franchises. Yeah, so we went franchising it, something. We opened this, and we already had franchisees signed. Okay. But like before we even opened the door here. So, wow. <laughs> so you know, going back to Randy, he had a vision yeah. and he was, you know, he, he had the network established. Yeah. And he had the network established. And, you know, I think the one thing that, that we didn't know that we know now is that this is a very complex concept to execute. Right. Why is that? Cooking on a walk is hard. It's hard to train it. Uh, it's it's hard to perfect it. Why don't you just stand still and cook? <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I had to. Uh, that was horrible. Right? No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> My kids yell at me all the time for dad jokes. I'm so. meant to have children yeah. someday. <laughs> all right, keep going. Um, we have to interrupt today's episode to let you know that every second and fourth Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, Restaurant Systems Pro CEO Fred Langley is going live to teach you everything you need to know to run a profitable restaurant from soup to nuts. All you got to do is click the link below. You know, and, and having, you know, we have, you know, 35, 40 sauces made from scratch, uh, everything cooked fresh. It's, it's hard, right? Yeah. So you have to have a very specific type of operator to execute the brand properly. Right. Right. So, you know, his network brought him to other restaurateurs but not necessarily ones that were suited for this full service style of restaurant Got it. right and there's one thing to go to be full service fine dining right because that's slow and it's very intentional and uh you i think you have a little bit more leeway on not expectations right because you're you know you want to be at a, a very high level with fine dining but it's not turn and burn, right? For us, like if you were at a fine dining restaurant and a food takes 20 minutes to come to your table, it's no big deal. People generally aren't in a rush right. when they're doing fine. They're going out and like the meal is, the, they're not catching a meal and then going to a movie. Right. Like that's what we're doing tonight. Yeah. 20 yeah. minutes here and the yeah. scorched earth. Right. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a different mindset. And then we had other franchisees that were just QSR. And now they have to figure out how to do a full service Right. And what hospitality really is and, and how to execute these steps. You know, so we had several failed franchisees for one reason or another, you know, and I think we just realized, like, right, if we're going to continue this process, we have to be very, very selective of who we give franchise, who we award franchises to. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, as we grow and, and we look into doing more franchising, there will be a lot more vetting that goes into it and making sure that these these future partners can execute. They understand hospitality. They live and breathe hospitality. I think that that you can't teach that. Right? Right. If you're a giving person, you want to care for others. That's inherent. Right. right, you can't teach. I can teach you how to carry a tray. Right, I can't teach you how to give an F. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, what point? What was the next evolution for you? Um, so, I think it went into um, helping open franchise locations, getting to work with the franchisees a little bit, the training piece. Um, you know, getting that face time with the, the franchisees. You know, these guys are entrepreneurs who, you know, have either gathered. A, a lot of cash flow to to open these restaurants to put a million into it or, or however much into it um who've, who probably know far more than i i do as you know this little right corporate guy right um but being able to communicate on their level have those conversations intelligent conversations with them so they they buy into what we're we're spieling right because we have our systems we have our processes right and you're entrepreneur well i have my systems and my processes and they're better than yours you guys suck right that i feel like a lot of times the the franchise or franchisee partnership is often a one upsmanship instead of working together for the best results of the franchisee and the brand okay Uh, how do you overcome that it's a lot of proving and it's a lot of explaining the why Right, going back to this is why we do these things. This is why we do line checks. Right. And in that line check, we want you to taste all 35 of those sauces. Right. Right, because when you hit that sauce in the wok, if it's wrong, the whole dish is wrong. Right. right. And I think a lot of people get in trouble with franchise. If you're a franchisor trying to find the right fan- tr- franchisee, uh, it's like you're just like, you're like money, you're, you're trying to money grab. You're like, right. oh, you have the $1 million it costs to buy in. Sweet, here's your restaurant, and it's like, oi, were you the right culture fit? Were you know, did you know what you're getting yourself into? Like, are you are you about ego or are you a team player? Do you have the same vision? Do you know right. where we're going and do you want to come with us? Yes. Yeah. You know, and and you know, we have um, one of our partners, our, our partner in Idaho, very successful restaurateur himself, right? So uh, he has a, a particular way that he wants things done, and he's he. If I'm 100% honest, from a hospitality standpoint, his restaurants probably execute better than ours, right? And I'm, I'm again, I'm, I have no ego. I have no problem saying that. And I'm elated to see their secret shopper reports come in. And if they're higher than ours, great, right? That means that they understand right. and they're buying, whether they, whether they say it and they know every piece of our culture they're executing it. Like right. you said, it's what's going on every single day. Also putting your own ego aside and maybe you can go to them and say, like, to make us better. Right. Like, what are we doing that you're not? Yeah. Or what are, what are, what are you doing that we're not? Yeah. Like, and how, I, I think, and how can you share this with the rest of the the, the whole yep. of all the franchisees? You know, I think one of the things we've, we've put a lot of initiatives in this year already to make things better and easier for the franchisees. And, you know, one of them is Opus Training, uh, it's all digital based training. How do you discover Opus? Uh, digging around. So we went yeah. to a, a restaurant. What is, what is Opus? Uh, so it's a, a training platform, a LMS platform, learning management system. Yeah. Right. So we use it for all of our onboarding. Right. And you can build modules for every position that takes them from orientation all the way through every day of training uh, and certification. And then furthermore, we can continue as we roll out LTOs and promotions, we can put those courses in there and blast it out to the entire company. So it's all on everyone's phone. All the server has to do is open it up, see what's assigned to them, and go through, read through the material, take the little quizzes that are in there. And it makes it, you know, we're, today we just rolled out a a gift card promotion, moms, dads, and grads, right? Um, We're able to, blast out a little course about it to make sure everyone knows about it so no one is left in the dark right right and too because uh, may is may 1st as the recording of this episode yeah and graduation is at the end of the month yep so you end of the month and then we got mother's day in two weeks and you know so it's 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 getting that information out there right because we've always had the information there but you have to dig through you know we were using sharepoint so you have to dig through sharepoint to pull up the training manual and 
read it and like it's it's with the way that culture has moved having an interactive digital platform for training helps people retain things better right and we know when someone goes through training even if they go through and we they get everything out of it they're only going to come out knowing i don't know 60 70 percent of what they should know what is it about the opus experience that makes it more retainable because it's it's quick hits of information that is you know the way that that I sound like an old man. Kids these days retain information, right? But it's it's an inconvenient truth, my friend. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's it's short hits, short doses of information. Yeah, right. And then you reinforce it with a quick little quiz, or you know, uh, you can make them. You can kind of make them game. You know, we also use one huddle on the side too. Well, so. I was curious because what you're describing sounds a lot like one huddle. So the the one thing that one huddle does that we found. One huddle is great for reinforcing information, but when it comes to rolling out information, it's not the best. It's not like it wasn't optimal for us. Okay. So we had done one huddle for the past, basically through 2023, yeah, testing it out and, and giving it to our, our trainees uh, that were just onboarding, and it just it wasn't 100% clicking. Okay. Um, so what we're using now is one huddle to reinforce but opus to introduce. Right. So this this whole process, so as I was a commercial pilot, um, mm-hmm. and the way that you study to take, this is probably kind of terrifying, honestly, when you really think <laughs> about it. The way that you, you study to become a commercial pilot, you go through the training, you have the, the actual like flying, the groundwork, where you're discussing, you're learning things. But to become a commercial pilot, the way you take the test, it's, called, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple choice question. And okay. you get this giant book. That's like, I don't know, like four to five inches, six inches thick, depending on what certification you're going for. Right. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a section, a chapter where it covers a, a little bit of material. And then the back end, there's all the possible questions that you could get asked, multiple choice. And then you go through and you take the test, and then it tells you what the answer is. Okay. So like, basically, the way to study for it is you just read all of the questions, questions. And you memorize the answers. Mm, yeah. And if you do it enough, eventually you can pass the test. Right. But it's, a, but it's a, that same thing where, like, you don't need to go to the section that it tells you everything. Mm-hmm. You can just go to the section where you take the test right. and memorize the important stuff. Yeah, that but is what, a little terrifying. It is kind of terrifying. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the power of one huddle is um, it's like a 10-question test, right? Or, it's or a, Opus. You know, you can do – yeah, you can do – Opus, you can do as many as you want. Um, I want to say one huddle is, you know, maybe fifteen questions. Max, yeah, it's, it's right. It's, like it's it's point, short, right? The point is, it's a short. It's a short. Maybe take you two minutes yep. max to take the quiz. Yep. And then you don't get access to any of the information, the the, the data that you're the, the the booklet. You just take the question. You yep. just answer the questions. Like yep. you, And then if you get like five out of, you know, fifteen, then you take it again. You take it again. You take it again. You take it again yep. until you get a like. A, a passing score, right. and the the goal is to take to take the the test as fast as possible with a one hundred percent correction. Right. But the real magic behind it, I think, is that you get to see what everybody else is getting as a score. So if you're a dog, yep. If if you're getting like if it's taking you ten minutes to answer fifteen questions and Sally did it in two minutes and got a one hundred, you're gonna take it over and over and over and over again. So yep. you don't look like a schmuck right. next to Sally. Yep. But what happens is you end up memorizing the, the the only the things you need to know. Yep. So like it's it's a super way to make it sticky. It's a it's like a it's like hacking the memory. Yep. Um, and what we liked about Opus is that it it does all that, but it also gives an a library of informa- of information. Right, so you can go through. You can upload all of your training material. Right, so we have our hospitality sequence, which are steps of service. Right, we can put that in, and they have to click on it and they have to read through it, and then you have, then you can have a little quiz after it, right after. Right, so it's in. No matter what, all that library, what's assigned to them based on their position, server, bartender, walk cook, whatever, all of that information lives. In their phone, Got so it. they have access to that information. So if they ever have a question of, you know, what are the allergies or what what do I, what am I supposed to do if this happens? Yeah, it's all there. Can you 
get into the like how you're so you mentioned it earlier you're using opus to be more of an lms onboarding process mm -hmm. and you're using uh one huddle to be more of a one-off um educating but can you get into a little bit like more detail on how you use those two to complement each other because i've never i've heard of one i've heard yep. the, i've heard of both of these mm -hmm. but i've never heard them being used together yeah and these aren't little investments either. no no they're not but it's it's for us it's worthwhile right okay. so because there's nothing more valuable than a knowledgeable confident teammate right right and the more we can do to make our teams more knowledgeable and more confident the more money they're going to make the yeah. The, the more they're going to sell, the better the experience, the better the be. experience. Right. Um, so we did, we had one huddle going. Um, How do you discover one huddle? Actually through. I was wondering the podcast. The Sam yeah. Paiuchi episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's a CEO of one huddle for the record. Yeah. Um, so that one, like that piqued my interest and I, you know, did the, the calls with them and went through and where's Opus based, you know, New York, New York. Yep. Oh, I'm going to have to get them on the show on the way back. So we, 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 I went to a conference, a restaurant conference in Palm Springs last fall, and there were a couple different LMS platforms that were represented there, and uh, Opus just ended up being what we thought was going to be the best one for us. And again, our goal was to, how do we get information out to all of our franchisees at the same time, right, and make it seamless, right? The, the less friction you put in place for a franchisee, the more buy-in you're going to get from them. Okay? So, um, again, with, with SharePoint, SharePoint's great for holding documents and you know being able to, to, to share everything, but there's a little bit of friction of learning that system and how to, to yeah. navigate, right? I feel like Opus and One Huddle are more about cracking the human code yes. of like creating that path of these resistance yep. to make it sticky. Yep. Yeah. And just having... So, basically, what we've done now is Opus we're using for anything that's new okay so if you're a new employee you're going to take the onboarding module for your position okay uh and it's it's laid out day by day so you have to go through it every single piece day by day there's a certification every single day has a check-in that a manager or a trainer has to complete so they literally have to sit there and and pull up their check-in and ask the employee hey how did you do on this what did you think of today and they can rate one out of ten they can check off to make sure that they completed all the different assignments in the module for the day. Um, we have a the certification for all of our servers and bartenders. You take a final test, but you also serve a trainer or a manager, right? Just like you would a guest, right? Uh, so the manager has that certification in there, so they can check off, and it's basically based off of our secret shopper reports. Yeah. Did they greet the guests properly? Did they offer this? Did they talk about this? Did they pre-bust the table properly? All those kinds of things. Yeah. We're not even touching on one thing that I think is critically important to using technology like this. Mm -hmm. How much time and energy went into managing booklets before? So printing, much. Printing so booklets, much. Ridiculous. All this stuff. Yeah. Now you upload it once. Yep. Um, and if you need to make an, an amendment... You do it one time, yeah, and, and it pushes to everything. So easy. Think about like as we one of the big lessons, like I think the obvious glaring things that we're looking at as we march into the future, and as the cost of goods go up and the cost of labor goes up, your your total your prime costs go up. Mm -hmm. Is you're going to learn how to have to do more with less. Yes. In these technologies, people really struggle trying to figure out how they justify to the, the investment, right? So, get into that next. Like what, like. What is the investment for one huddle in Opus? What are you paying monthly for these? What was this do single unit off? Like, because um, I know you have multiple units. Well, so we're doing one huddle just for our corporate restaurants, so the two yeah. restaurants. So it's like three hundred thirty dollars a month. Yeah. For each restaurant, uh, one huddle or times sorry, seven? Opus. Oh no, times six because one is. Well, close what, well, we're we're not using one huddle for the franchisees. Got it. Right. It was something that we did, and we decided to continue for ourselves. Right. Opus is. Uh, God, I want to say seven, eight grand a year. No, it's got to be more than that. It's like twelve hundred dollars a month, I okay. think, for all. So it's it's by user. So we have about two hundred and fifty users in our platform, and that puts us in like the I think it's twelve hundred dollar tier, right? Something like that. So, but you have to look at like what what are you paying a manager salary mm -hmm. to go sit at a table and play with paper all right. day, like, or or even worse. 
how much time was I doing it? Right. Right. Because I, we're not a big company, so I don't have this big office. Right. I don't have a full staff of, of corporate employees. Yeah. It's me. I have our corporate executive chef, and I have a regional manager. Right. Right. Like that's that's kind of our senior team. So how much time was I spending uploading documents to the training stuff and and you know proofreading and doing all that kind of stuff? Now it's like you said, it's it's all in here. It uses AI to generate things, so you can upload something. It scans that document and it can create a course based on that document, right? And it makes it digestible for people with short attention spans, right? And then it'll come up with quiz questions and everything for you. So it's super, super useful. And the amount of time that we save is invaluable. Right. Yeah. So, and I think that's, I think humans are by nature linear thinkers. Mm-hmm. They're not, they don't, we're not hardwired to, th- to think exponentially. Right. And what happens when you use software like this, you can save time. And, and it, what ends up happening is it's an exponential saving right. over time. Yep. Uh, so you have to think of it that way. And um, anyway, I, this is, man, this is a really great conversation. I'm Thank super you. enjoying it. Um, so I want to come back to the tech stack layer before mm-hmm. we, we talk about like where you, we, you went down this rabbit hole and, and I <laughs> love this shit. So I, right. let, I let it happen. But I do want to, before we start talking about more about where you are today, let's go back because you are the sole proprietor of Lingo Louis yep. restaurants. Yep. Um, when did that happen? So 2019. So officially January 2nd, 2019 is... Uh, Ooh, good timing. Yeah, technically my wife and I uh, are the owners of the company. Um, you know, we spent probably the latter half of 2018 kind of negotiating the deal with, with Randy, previous yeah. owners. So wh- and, why did, did Randy ever tell you why he was ready to, to relinquish control okay, so he had just sold the risk Chris steakhouses and made a ton of money off how of old it. was he at this point uh, maybe 60 maybe so he was it was time yeah yeah and I think, you know, I, look he had a long successful career and i think he saw an opportunity to get out and it was it so when he had sold it and they told us about it i'm like all right it's gonna go one of two ways he's out and he's retiring or he's gonna take some of that money invest in the ling and louis brand and let's grow it yeah, uh, and it you know it was, became pretty apparent that he wasn't gonna yeah. grow it right. He was in all due respect out on a beach in Florida. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah, right? or actually probably Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at that point, I said, "Look, there's 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 not gonna be any growth for me," and that's when I left. Right, and, and at that the time was the, on the wall. Yeah, and and I think I ten years in, um, I, I needed a refresh. I needed a, something to refresh my my passion well at this point you're at one two three four restaurants in like an 18 year period yep which is four perspectives yeah you know like that's um it's good to diversify your perspective Mm -hmm. so you say to yourself you want to go to suma maya suma maya yep so it was you know i think you you see a, a pattern where it's all asian inspired cuisine this one was more asian mexican fusion yeah um more upscale, very nightlife heavy. Um, and I, I walked in there and just the, it was so uplifting to see the, uh, the creativity that was going into the cuisine, talking to the chef and how passionate he was, talking to the owner and how passionate he was. Uh, the team was, you know, there were a core group of that team that I still keep in touch with today that were very passionate about what they did and, and how they did it. And it reinvigorated me. Like it, it literally brought back all sorts of creativity. Like I, I, my whole creative side had kind of died out and I was just, I hate to admit it, but kind of going through the motions and, and that was it, right? I think and it's a common trap, man. Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. yeah. And um, Especially after 10 years, 15 years of doing something. Yeah. 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 So it, it sucked because we, you know, we we're in a good spot and we got to, you know, we're negotiating probably September, October, November. And I remember going out to lunch with the owner at the time because he wanted to talk to me. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And he wanted to talk to me about his plan for growth of the Sumo Maya brand. I said, cool. Okay. So, but. I had already made the decision that we were going to buy Ling and Louie's. Yeah. So 
I had to, before he even got into the conversation about what he wanted for growth, I said, I, I, I hate to do this to you. I don't want to cut it short. And I know this is going to make lunch very, very awkward. But I've gotten this opportunity to buy my former brand and become you, become an owner. Yeah. And I know he was disappointed, but he was also like, you gotta get I, it. I can't blame you, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we had, you know, an awkward lunch, but, you know, uh, and we ended November. I think November that November was the highest sales at that restaurant and highest profitability that that restaurant had ever done to that point. Um, you know, and I, I stuck around through the end of the year. The last day was uh, New Year's Eve. And then two days later, we signed the paperwork to to take over Ling and Louis. Any advice on going through that transaction? Um, and it sounds like Randy, just from listening to you, wasn't looking to screw you over. At this point, you also have a relationship with him. Yeah, you know, like he a mentor mentee type situation. Yeah. no, so he took he took really good care of us, and he told the picture of what being taken care of looks like, so other people know when they're being taken care. Right. Of. So he he said, "Look, I I want to make it so." A, I want the brand to carry on, and we think you're the right guy to carry the brand forward, right, and continue its evolution. Yeah. B, I want to set you up so you and your wife and your family can have a nice life, right? You know, if, if you want to go grow it and become multimillionaires or whatever, then we're, we're going to try to set you up for that, right? So we ended up doing a, a seller finance deal um, where it was, you know, we, we kind of looked at the, the brand at the time, we had one franchise location was going to close in a year uh, because their their 10 years was up. Um, another one was going to be done in like two or three years because their their 10 year window was up. Um, and then we had the Idaho the one restaurant in Idaho that was going to renew for they had a five year extension option, right? So we knew that. So we knew that we are going to lose revenue from two franchisees closing down. This restaurant at the time was doing 1.8, 1.9 million in sales. So nothing, nothing crazy. I mean, it was enough to, to sustain and make, you know, maybe $100,000 a year or something like that. How, do, how much total revenue were you looking at with all the locations? Um, it, since, how, since you've owned it, have you had it close anything? No. Okay. No. Um, so we've, we've had... I don't know. We've increased this from 1.9 to 3 million. Oh wow! Um, you know, and we're, we will break the 3 million dollar mark this year, uh, which will be the first for us. Congratulations! Um, thank you. Um, you know, we—that's such a fucking testament, dude. Like to take a 10 year old. Wait, 2008. Two, 2008 a, is a when it 16 opened. 16 year old brand. Yeah. Yep. And to have the best year, 16 years after is a testament to you and your 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 discipline to Kaizen. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to take I want to pause for a second and say, holy shit, dude. I'm Thank so you. happy I'm sitting on the other side of the table. Thank you. Me? Yeah, it's been it's been a, a trip and really, you know, we were super fortunate, you know, COVID sucks for everyone, but we were okay. Yeah. Right? And then twenty twenty one ended up being our busiest year ever. Yeah. And then twenty twenty two was our busiest year ever and now, you know, that's so on fucking and so forth. Awesome, yeah. Dude. I'm so. psyched for you. Five years I'm coming back when you have twenty <laughs> locations across That's, that's the goal. That's yeah. the goal. So um real quick, um I, I pulled you back I pulled you off of what you were saying. So go back to that train of thought of like the passing of the baton. Yeah, so we uh, we set up a deal to basically where I could take the profits of this restaurant and pay them back over the course of five years so it was a simple interest you know we agreed on a number because of certain things closing down um we agreed that i would take over the brand and become the franchisor um so it was again they they did their best to set me up for success um and i think at the end of the day we came out way better than we could have ever hoped or imagined because the one franchisee decided on the day that they were supposed to close, they said, what are we doing? Our clientele loves this. It's in a casino here in town. So, and they were, they were like, our, our clientele loves you, loves this brand. We want to keep it. And we re-signed a deal, right? Nice. That, you know, basically the day that they were <laughs> supposed to close down. Uh, and then we have another one in the DFW airport. That's which I did not get. I gotta be honest. That, Again, it was the connections. Totally, it was the connections that Randy had, right? Because usually the airport restaurants 
are like super hyper. I think this is a, maybe a newer trend. Mm-hmm. Not so. So maybe when Randy was rolling this out, they hadn't gotten there yet. But the the airport usually reflects market the market. Right. right? So you're getting a taste of the market. When you fly in there, yep, it's a like it's a, you're showcasing the community. So the what they were trying to do because like HMS host and SSP are like the big dogs in all the airports, right? They're the big operators, and they they sign franchise deals with a lot of the local restaurants. Yeah. A lot of airports are now also putting in some minority operators. So the franchisee there was one of those minority operators, and they had a few other brands in their portfolio that they were already franchisees of. That, um, but they needed an Asian brand to to Got it. fill in the the hole that yeah. So ours, doing my research and looking at where you're, I was like, you got one in Dallas for I'm, yeah. If I'm coming off as an asshole right now, no, no, no. no. Uh, you have one in Dallas, Fort Worth. You got two in Idaho. You got yep. two, and I was like, you're so spread out. How are you in all these different places? Right, and, and it, it was it was all because the those original relationship. Yep franchisees were sense, relationship yeah. based yeah. you know we also had denver we had reno nevada like there were just some kind of off the wall ones there's a know. method to my madness i mean when i go into an interview like i mm-hmm. try not to know too much i just like to have a big enough idea of what's going on but the, this is really my research yeah the conversation in the which is why it's two hours long plus sometimes right. because i needed time to do the research uh but anyway um any other thoughts on that before we move forward to what no, you are I, today? I, I, again i think it's it's Sometimes you, I think, we call it luck a lot of the times, but I think nothing, luck is based off of hard work yeah. and everything that you've put into the moment. And yeah. then, you know, when you get a good break, like we did, uh, and we've been super fortunate to, to continue growing. Yeah, I love this, man. Um, so let's go to where you are. We started talking about, like, earlier, where you are today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I mean, so 2009... I mean, the pandemic. I don't. We don't. I kind of like to skip over that because right. we all know it sucked. Yep. It's not standard operating. You know, like mm-hmm. I feel like it's a. If we if we if we have another pandemic on the horizon, I'll start talking more about how to handle that. Right. But hopefully, <laughs> uh, I think I, hopefully everyone remembers how to. This is me knocking deal on the wood. If you can hear it yeah. through the microphone. <laughs> um, so let's bring it to like two. The last two years, really, mm-hmm. two thousand two to two thousand twenty four. Yeah. Well, I do. I, if I could just bring up the pandemic one part of it Please. is we we created a secondary brand from our experience operating the pandemic right we realized when we could only operate at 50 percent capacity with a heavy focus on takeout and delivery that we could be just as profitable uh so we ended up creating ling's walk shop which okay. is our new uh you know it's been open we're in our third year now but it is uh we call it flex casual right so it's counter service during the day full service at night and uh, it just it allows us to do a much smaller footprint with less yeah. overhead, focus on takeout and delivery, and be just as profitable. Yeah. yeah. So taking a trusted brand yep. and making it more accessible. Um, so do people associate Ling's Walk with Ling and Louise? Slowly. Slowly. So we 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 you know we have some similar items. You know we took some of the more popular ones from here and put it on the menu up there. Um, but I'm trying to you know we're we're in the middle of doing our next menu revamp yeah we're trying to differentiate them more and more how come there isn't a louis stove <laughs> there's too many louis <laughs> out there there's bar louis there's oh, a couple true. other louis restaurants yeah, lucky lou's that. you don't want to do that dance with yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna get in trouble if yeah, i do that so for sure <laughs> uh okay so um i mean what what do you want to talk about anything we haven't spoken about up to this point where you think you have a unique piece of information for the record man we're about to eclipse two hours okay um i try to keep it under two hours but honestly speaking like i don't need to but you agreed to two hours right so (laughs) if you you have things to do no i'm good put me in my place um you know I, i was we were just arizona every april there's a restaurant leadership conference okay. here. So I'm sure some of your listeners have, have ventured out to, to participate in it. And there was a, a CEO forum that they just did. And I think it was the CEO of Crumble Cookies that, in, in what he was talking about, like what he's learned as a CEO that resonated with me so much. And it was basically, don't be afraid to fire yourself, mm. right? So I think a lot of us as operators, as you know, owners, we dig so deep and we're, we're, we have our fingers in every level of the business. And there's a certain point where you're doing a disservice to your team 
and your business by doing that. So yeah. you have to realize that you at you know forty percent is way more of a detriment than someone else doing it at eighty ninety percent, right? So that's been over the past I'd say year has been my biggest growth is learning how to actually be a CEO, how to actually take a step back and trust your team, right? You hire these people for a reason, put your trust in them and let them flourish. Let them, even if they're, even if you, you're you seeing them and they're probably going to make a mistake that you've already made, yeah. let them learn for themselves. Yeah. Ironically, you know, it's, I always try to bring the conversation back to me because it is a conversation. You know, mm-hmm. it is an interview, but at the same time, I resonate with a lot of what's said. And I feel like, as a as an entrepreneur, if you're more like me, who so I actually find that to be the easiest thing. Okay. As a promoter, yep. I'm like, can I just get the fuck out of the way? <laughs> like, I just want to be. I literally, I, I want like. So they talk about this in 10x is easier than 2x. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's the same concept of what is the 20 percent of the things that only you should be doing, right. that you are uniquely qualified for, that nobody can do better than you, because like this is why you were put on this planet to do these things. Do those things. Surround yourself with everybody else that's that's doing their unique ability in the, di- the different verticals of your business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think my unique ability is seeing the unique ability in others and being like, wow, I'm jealous of how good you are at that. <laughs> like, yeah. can you please do this so I don't fuck it up? Because right. I'm going to fuck it up. Um, but the challenge to that is that you can't get the thing up to the point because of all the little detail work, like the, 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 the technician work, the manager work that you need to do to be able to get to thing to the point where you can outsource everything because right. you're too busy dreaming all day, right. you know, <laughs> dreaming and just like thinking about what you can do and what you want to do that. And then you're like, and this is what I think one of the biggest reasons why I think my fear, my biggest fear is becoming is, is being a um, con artist mm-hmm. because I dream so much. I want to change the fucking world is in my mission state. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then it's like, Oh wait, that's going to be hard. <laughs> like it's going to be hard to change the world. And like you make these promises and then you're just like, Oh shoot. Like I didn't realize how hard it's going to be. Mm-hmm. You're always shooting for the stars. Right. So like uh, it's a weird balance, you know, what's going through your mind as I'm sharing that. I think there's, you know, I, I hear a little bit of like imposter syndrome right. in that, that statement. And I, I think we all go through that little bit of self doubt. Um, and I, I, I feel like I go through it almost weekly. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I have a, a coach that I work with that has helped me realize like, give him a shout out. Her name is Lisa. Um, so I'm, I'm part of a group called Vistage, which is uh, a group for CEOs. And, nice. and it's, it's helped me realize that you are here. You're doing it, right? And whether you realize it or not, you are changing the world. Right. Right? You, you, you and your podcast has been a huge influence on me, right? So having that and learning so much from listening to others because you have brought them to this forum changed me. And now I'm in a position where I, too, can start changing the world. And I'm not... You know, I'm not looking at it globally, but I'm looking at it from a, my community. That's not how we're going to do it. Right. It's got to be a community-based thing. I think thing. that's the power of the restaurant industry is if we can change s- s- single restaurant tours, mm-hmm. they're going to turn around and take those lessons and they're going to implement it in their in their community, but immediately with their employees. Yep. Right. And then their employees are going to turn around and ripple it out to their their guests. And like that's how we're going to change the that's world right. by raising the bar on individuals, and then the individual turning around and rippling out. And when you have a platform like Restaurant Unstoppable, where the message is getting out worldwide. Right. And you can give access to these these individuals and their thoughts. And it's not just Restaurant Unstoppable. There's other podcasts out mm-hmm. there that are doing it. Um, but it's so powerful. And I think that's why I have I have so much hope for the future is because we're becoming more conscious than ever before. Because how many 40-year-old males do you think knew what emotional intelligence was in 1990? <laughs> None. <laughs> exactly my point. None. Like we're we are understanding. We're wrapping our minds around what it yep. means to be conscious. I think it was in when I was with Bamboo Club. We did a big like GM conference, and it was you know early two thousands, and they I first heard the term seek to understand, then be understood. Yeah. Right, and that's something that is one hundred percent relevant today. Right, we have to understand who we're talking to who's on our team, who we're coaching, who we're developing to get the most out of them, right? And then figure out how they digest information so that 
we can deliver the message in the most impactful way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so that was early two thousands and it's taken a very long time for, you know, at the time, very revolutionary thinking in management to really be hopefully the norm in what we're doing today. Yeah. Man, I'm really loving this conversation. Uh, I do want to respect your time. Mm -hmm. I, I did get you to, to talk before we hit record and say that it's okay to talk about numbers. Yes. And yep. I know that there's a lot of people that it, when, when I get the open door, I am walking through it brush right. open, <laughs> man. Um, so you, you mentioned before, uh, hit us with the total revenue that all of your concepts are doing. Uh, so, all, well, do you want it with the franchisees? Or? Well, I mean, I just kind of noticed, too, we didn't spend any time. We, we mentioned Walk. Mm -hmm. um, Lu, uh, Louis Walk. Not Ling, Louis, Ling's Walk Shop. Ling's Walk, thank yep. you. Uh, Ling's Walk Shop. You also have the Ghost Kitchen. Yep. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to get into that, if, that's, um, if you, if you, you factor know, that in. I think our Ghost Kitchen, yeah, we factor those into our sales here yeah. at Ling & Louis. So, you know, that's that's $3 million a year. Uh, Ling's Walk Shop is one point seven million. Three a million a year with just the ghost kitchen. No, 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 just out of this oh, restaurant. Okay. What as percentage a whole? of total revenue comes from Ling's Walk? About Shop? About five percent, no. or from Shoot, Ghost I'm, Street. I'm screwed. Yeah, thank yeah. you. From Ghost Street, maybe five percent. Okay. You know, it's not it's not big. Um, is it because you're not putting the energy into it? It's yeah, mostly. Okay. I, you know, there's there's so much for us to focus on as Ling and Louis right. is the brand, and Ghost Street came as a a way for us to hit a different segment. I love your branding, by the way. Thank you. Um, especially with Ghost Street, I think that's a really sharp looking yeah. brand. And we have we have an amazing designer that give him a shout out, uh, Tanya with Miss Details. Nice. Um, she does like we've worked together for so long. Yeah, and she gets me. She understands my vision of things, so yeah. it's very easy for me to to kind of give her a description. I think it would be a good interview to go deep into branding design. I think that would be amazing. She like her whole thing is. Sensory branding. Yeah. So smell, touch, feel, visual. Well, right? what, what I like about the uh, ghost kitchen taqueria uh, is that it's it's Asian Mexican. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Um, and the branding is very Asian, but also like the details of like the yeah like the it's a very much combining like the silhouette of a like almost Japanese is it Japanese? so it's a it's a geisha okay. with the candy skull paint yeah. Yeah, and I was like, "Wow, that's yeah. sharp, man." Yeah, so, she's she's talented. Yeah, and uh, like the minute she sent it to me, I said, "That's it, right?" Yeah. I didn't even have to question it. Like she had several others, but I said, yeah. "That's it." Yeah, we gotta get her on the show. Yeah, um, one of the things I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be better about, is slowing down really in interviews mm -hmm. and finding the leads to get more at, like assassins. Yeah, like the the people behind the restaurants. Yes. The show. Yep. So um, this is I wouldn't have been able to do that in a 30 minute conversation, right. now, would I? No. So anyway, That's I think true. there's something to be said about the power of now slowing down, being present, going. Absolutely. Deep. Um, so big picture again. So mm -hmm. three million. You just you're gonna eclipse three million with uh, with uh, Ling and Louise. Ling and Louise with the Ghost Kitchen, yep. which is five percent. Yep. Uh, Ling's Walk Shops at one point seven million. Um, so both of our restaurants. You know, I think an industry standard for like really good revenue is a thousand dollars a square foot in annual revenue, and we're we're at that for both of our locations. A um, thousand per square foot. Yep, and we're we're, you know, I think we're going to get Ling's Walk Shop to the point where it's doing two plus million in the next year or two. Um, we got some tweaks that we're going to do to the uh, to the concept to to help drive some of that revenue and really focus on some catering initiatives. So you're going to get. Uh, Ling's Walk to two million. You said that's the goal. Yep, yeah. and I think that that's you know we're we're right on that cusp of of making that that change so that we can do that. So three million with this location we're sitting in. Yep. One point seven million with which location? With Ling's Walk Shop. Oh, okay. Sorry, yep. that's we're right. Good. Uh, but you're hoping to get that over two million in the next year. So you're at yep. five million with. Uh, but what about the uh, franchise? And then the franchisee. So if you take all of our rest restaurants together uh we're about 20 million dollars okay. in revenue wow man um you know we as a franchisor we only see you know a percentage of how does that those work? sales what, what percentage so like if you get like if you get like total like so they're doing 20 percent profit mm -hmm. right what percentage of the pr profit do you get as a franchisor so it's not based off of profit we're going off of sales okay so um depending on the franchisee i think pretty average is five percent plus okay. plus a marketing fee so um you know and we're going off of deals that were made prior so four so locations are each making approximately five five million is that right uh i would say yeah 
Okay, that's about that's right. awesome. Yeah. So is this the, the lowest performance? This is the lowest, but it's also wow. the smallest by like... Okay, footprint-wise. So yeah. you have the ability to do th- throughput. How many seats here? Uh, about 150 with our patio. How many seats in the average other franchise? <laughs> more than we'd like. <laughs> Why? Um, is it, is it, so is it we, when, overhead? Really, when much? we designed this concept, it was, uh, I th- when we first d- designed it, we said 3,000 square feet. Okay. Right? Now that we're, you know, we're 16 years into it, we kind of understand optimization. What is optimal? So 4,000 square feet would be optimal. Okay. Uh, our Idaho franchisee is, his restaurants are, I don't know, 7,000 and 8,000 square feet. Like, Real, like twice as big as as what they should be, but but they he fills them up. So you know, again, when you give some leeway and you know that they can they execute, know their market better. Than yeah, you like yeah. go for it if you want to put that capital yeah. in. What about right? consistency within markets? I mean, I feel like if you did like the um, you know like the centrific circle approach, mm-hmm. where like you start with a single location and then you go like two miles out, yep. and then two miles out from that. Yep. I think it's more important to have it be consistent. Mm-hmm. But when you have people that are literally a thousand miles away, or it's, it's tough. Miles away, yeah. Well, I think you get a little more wiggle room in terms of um, how letting it be a little different to meet the, the demands of the market, right. because the likelihood of there being a, a Scottsdale person in Boise and they're like, "Oh, I know exactly what I'm going to get," and it's right. like, as long as it's a little the same. Yeah. Well, uh, so we have a core menu, right? Yeah. And that's that's at the crux of everything that yeah. we do, right? And that, that that core menu sticks with our branding of modern Asian cuisine with American flair, right? Um, so if Idaho wants to have their a sushi bar, a full sushi bar with sushi chefs and that, you know, that's, there's some capital that goes behind that, right? Because you have the labor of the sushi chefs, the training that goes into it, building out the sushi bar, having all of those products on hand, right? right. So if they can do that and they feel that they can execute it and they, they've proven to us that from an execution standpoint, they can rock it, Right. We're open to those discussions, Got it. right? So, but it's 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 kind of like show me, prove yeah. it to me that you want a little bit more, that Got you it. can handle a little bit more. Let's talk about percent profit. Mm-hmm. So you're doing three million at this current location, mm-hmm. uh, 150 seats. Yep, that's awesome, man! Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. Um, and what percent profit? Uh, we're about 15 percent here. Okay. So there's there's still some wiggle room for us, and I think one of the things that we've learned, um, you know, especially after going to uh, the create conference last year which is for emerging brands like these big investors savory fund and and those guys they're looking for that 25 percent right so i came out of that going into 2024 knowing we got some work to do right um and you know we specifically in this restaurant the way that our company is structured my senior management you know where normally they wouldn't have their salaries in this restaurant they're budgeted into this restaurant right so, so you're doing four hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. out of the single unit profit, mm-hmm. which is awesome. That you can live off that, right? Yep. And then you also have soon to be two million. What's the percent profit with Walk? I'm that assuming one's it's about twelve percent right oh, now. Oh, really? That, I thought that, that one, would be higher. It needs to be higher, and that's why we're. But you're we're also making figuring some it out. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you know, you're. How many years have you had that open now? We're in our third year. So yeah, like now you're fine tuning. Yeah. Um. So. In terms of okay, now let's talk about the future. Your mm-hmm. your strategy to get from. 15% to over 20% mm-hmm. or even 25%. What's How do you think you're going to do it? How can you do it? Prime cost is first and foremost, so cost of goods and labor. That's kind of our big big focus right now. What are you using to manage that? Uh, we use R365 for accounting software. Um, we're using Mies. Now we just finally implemented Mies uh, for all of our recipes, uh, and that helps with costing. And What about labor? Uh, labor, it's seven shifts. Is Why our, wouldn't you be using the software that Restaurant 365 has? Not every... It's a, that's a good question. And actually, like, the same could be with, like, Toast. They... I don't feel that... R365 is really, really good at inventory and accounting. We played with their scheduling, and it was a pain in the ass. And it wasn't optimal for... Yeah for what we wanted, right? Yeah. Seven shifts, we feel, is from a, a communication standpoint and a, um, you know, just user, user friendliness. Yeah. It's it's as good as it gets, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper than hot schedules. Right. right? So what is your per unit cost of R365? 
Uh, we are about seven hundred dollars per unit. Per unit. Yep. Um, and what about hiring somebody that knows how to use it? Like uh, we pay um, twenty four hundred dollars a month, but they do all of our. They basically reconcile all of our books, um, all of our bank accounts. So they're. I don't want to say a fractional CFO because they don't. They don't get into the actual CFO and strategy right. stuff, but from a bookkeeping, a, a accounting. So That's you're looking at do. close to three thousand a month. Yep. Okay. Uh, and what are we paying for seven shifts? Ninety-seven dollars per location. Ninety-seven dollars per location yep. times five. Well, so, w- so that's just for our corporate restaurants. Okay, so, it. like our our fran- some of the franchisees are using hot schedules, and you know, we just like we just talked to them. I said, yeah. and we're looking at how they're using it. Like you're not even using this how you should right. be, right? Like you're. There's so much, like, if you're going to pay that much for hot schedules, you got to use it. Right. Right. I think a lot of people, there's a misconception is like, oh, like, I'm just going to pay this bill. My problem is going to go away. Mm -hmm. That thing is just a tool for you to do the thing better. 100%. You got to still use the tool. Yeah. You can buy a hammer and nails. Right. The house (laughs) isn't going to pill itself. Exactly. You know, so. um, And you have to, and you have to be diligent in looking at the numbers, right? You know, we're, we're in this age of information where every possible little detail in your financials is at your fingertips but whether or not you know how to use it and read it or whether or not you choose to apply it that makes all the difference right i there's a thousand reports in r365 yeah right but do you know which ones to look at that right. will help you have the biggest impact on your business right man um we're okay so before we wrap up with a few final questions, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Okay. Sorry, I'm totally abusing <laughs> your time. Um, so I like to. We talked about you know how you got here, where your business is today. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? Where, what are you doing to prepare for the future? So, uh, like I said, this year I, I told our team I said we are using this year to fine tune our numbers. Right, we need our cost of goods at a 25 percent. We need labor at 30, 30 to 32 percent. Right, we need to be from a prime cost standpoint at like a 57, 58% if we really want to grow. You know, 10 years ago, I would it was 55%. Don't forget, you got a camera over the oh, shoulder. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, that was a close um, one. Yeah, 10 years ago, it was 55%, right? And now with, you know, cost of goods going up, labor costs going up, you know, I think we're, we're comfortable trying to get that 57, 58% number. Uh, like I said, with Ling's Walk Shop, we're, make, we're going to be making some tweaks with the next menu rollout uh, to help that along. Um, but you know, our, our goal is, you know, by the end of this year, early next year to have a new location signed, a new yeah. lease signed for a, a new location. Uh, it'll probably be a Ling's walk shop. I think that is what I envision as the true growth vehicle right. for us, uh, especially on the franchising side. Right. It's smaller, less of a counter uh, service, less moving parts. Yeah, less, less, less of an investment. Yep. Right. And it's, you know, smaller we, footprint. Yeah. And we've seen you know when here like a lot of the complexity comes out of what we call the pantry side right so that's that's where a lot of our kind of more american stuff comes from the sushi comes from when we take that out and limit it like we have at links walk shop it makes the brand so much yeah. easier to execute and i think you're I, I think you could take a lot of inspiration from angie's mm-hmm. so you have the links brand mm-hmm. right um, where people associate quality with Lings, mm-hmm. uh, what they're like with what um, Tony uh, Christopoulos is doing with Angie's, yep. right? Where then you have you do Lings Walk, Lings fill in the blank, right? And now people are, associate that brand with quality, and there it gives you then you literally create a whole business around one menu option, right? You know, like 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 uh, Angie's. Uh, uh, lobster, yep. Angie's Burger, Angie's like they got a little more diversity with their grill. grill. Yep. Um, but anyway, I just feel like well, that's they had right. um, salad and go too, right? That was well, their he sold first. It. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. he he tried to scale that. The people that he took the capital mon- the capital from to scale it wanted mm-hmm. to go in a different direction and cut a lot of what he felt made them special. Mm-hmm. The, the cut costs, like sourcing, like good ingredients and right. things like that, yeah, yeah. and like they were going in a direction that just didn't feel right for him. And when you take the money, you kind of Got the golden handcuffs on, right? So he just he chose to to cash out and to take that ca- that huge payout yep. uh, to do basically Salomon Go 2.0, which is right. what he wanted to do. If they didn't, but now he has the money, right? So now he can start from the from scratch For and sure. do it the way he wants to do it. Nice. It's a fascinating interview, um, Tony. I'm happy to make an introduction too. Yeah, that'd be yeah. That'd, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, cool. 
Oh, I said it on the, re- or the recording. Now I have to do it. Right? <laughs> That's uh, right. Great guy. Um, man, this has been a lot of fun. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with some questions now. Sure. Um, what is one thing your business, a value, a process, a system that makes you truly un- uncommon? What is that one thing? Uncommon, I should say, and unstoppable. So, you know, we, uh, we, we implemented EOS. Um, Hell yeah, bro. Where was that? Yeah. So did I, I? I didn't even talk about oh that. Oh my huh? god! You yeah. know I'm an EOS yeah. nerd. I'm no. trying to get a self, full house of EOS self, authors. Self implementer. I don't, for better or worse. Um, but it's it's certainly gotten the fly the flywheel spinning for us, and we've made such headways with it. When did you start using that? Um, late last year, so or probably Q Q three of EOS? last year. Um, some other business oh, friends. Man, I was hoping you yeah. said it was I mean, I did. Well. You, I heard about it. I heard you talking about it, yeah. um, but I had already heard about it beforehand, and yeah. I was already reading Traction yeah. when you guys brought it up. Um, and you know, one of the things that you go through in that that process of implementing it is your proven process, right? You you have to come up BTO. with your yeah, right? vision traction organizer. That's right. I'm an EOS nerd, bro. So um, we had uh, sat with our senior leadership teams, and what are we doing? Like, what is our proven process? Yeah. And it came down to we have what we call the circle. Uh, that's that's part of our onboarding. We talk about it, and it's it's three parts. There's the inner circle, okay, which is our teammates and the restaurant, and then you have another circle around it, which is our guests, and then another circle, which is the community. So it's it's our whole process, and what's what's made us super successful is cultivating that inner circle, taking care of our team showing them the same respect and the hospitality that we want them to show our guests so that that radiates onto the guests and then it radiates into the community, right? So it's, it's not just creating regulars, but it is getting our hands into the community. Everything we do uh, up at Ling's Workshop, we, call, we do what's called Cooking for a Cause. It's a chef-created special every month. Five dollars from every dish sold goes to a, a partner. Sorry, I'm blocking the camera again. As long as you're talking, <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if you block the camera because if yeah. you're talking, that one's on. Yeah. Me. I was um, worried about you knocking it over because <laughs> you sure you yeah, don't, don't want to talk to anyone. You know you, you, you're talking with your hands. <laughs> um, but it, it's yeah, we did five dollars to a partner, a nonprofit partner. Uh, we do big hearted brunch here, so ten percent of our brunch sales every month goes to a nonprofit partner here in the community. So, uh, and that. We saw it in the pandemic, and we've seen it ever since, that that outreach to the community and giving back comes back tenfold, right? So that that is kind of at the heart of what we do is that circle and cultivating it from our team all the way out to the community. Yeah, awesome. Um, man, we should – I, w- I would love to go more into EOS, but that was supposed to be a one-off <laughs> answer. You did great. Uh, the mission statement is to change the world by inspiring, empowering, and transforming the industry. How have you personally transformed? So if we're going to transform the world by transforming one owner at a time, mm-hmm. give an example of your personal transformation. I, I think the probably the biggest transformation I've had is in the past several months. And a lot of it was working with the, my business coach and or the, the business group that I'm in. But it's... It is taking a completely different approach to management and leadership. And now it's going from telling people the answers to guiding them to discovering the answers themselves has been very transformational for for me and for our business. And again, it goes back to that, you know, as a very detail-oriented guy that wants to have his hands in everything, you have to be able to back off. You have to let others strive and excel at what they're supposed to excel at right so letting our our chef you know kind of un, uncuffing him and letting him go culinarily right and make decisions that he thinks are are best and and encourage him to make decisions without running it by me right yeah. same with our our regional manager and, and letting him uh you know really me stepping completely out of operations and letting things go um, there's oftentimes I'm here in the morning and then once the door opens, I'm out. Yeah. I leave because I'm just in the way. Yeah. So that, that's been a, a big transformation and it's, it's allowed, um, you know, our senior leadership to really figure out how to best manage and develop 
the young managers that are in our system right now. Love it, man. Yeah. Um, this is the last question. Okay. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure. With the exception of three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for the good of humanity and your legacy, what would those three pieces of wisdom be? You know, it's funny. I knew this question was coming, and I didn't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, so uh, there's there's a couple things that I've I've put into place for myself this year, right? Like, came up with some core values for myself. One of them, family first. I think is is of the utmost importance. I spent a good amount of my career putting the job first and neglecting my family and like I missed a lot of yeah. my kids growing up, right? My kids used to sleep. They'd come and visit me at night and they'd fall asleep in the booth behind you. I think you. there was a baby sleeping here. When that I that was our, our, our kitchen manager's <laughs> baby earlier, right? Um, every, I, was, I joked earlier and I said, every day is bring your kid to right? every day when you <laughs> yeah. own a restaurant. Yeah. I grew up and, in a restaurant. And, it, and, and to an extent it is, right? So um, being in a position now where I can put my family first and I can be there for all of my kids' games. I yeah. can fly out. You know, I, My oldest is in college in San Francisco, so I can... I'm flying out this weekend to go visit him. Man, right? you're making me feel like a slacker. You're 40 years old. How old are you? 43. 43. You yeah. got kids I started college. young. I started yeah. young. <laughs> we did it backwards. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, so family first. Um, do better every single day. Um, I think it's important to put the effort in to just improve mm-hmm. every single day, whether it's 1%, 2%, whatever. Don't be at the same place you were yesterday, today. Got it. Uh, and three. Um, this is something that I just saw the other day that uh, make hospitality is a choice. And it's something that, you know, when we go into, in, in this world where everything's so divided and everyone's at each other's throats, it seems, just be hospitable. Yeah. Hospitable hospitality, I think if, if we we just have so much associated that word with a business. But when you really look at what the definition of hospitality is, do you know the definition? Like, what is your definition? The, well, we have a specific definition here, but yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know the, the like the so Merriam-Webster. I think if you look it up, it's it's literally like warmth, generosity, communality, uh, it's giving. Yeah. It's literally giving, and I think that we are hardwired to give. I mm-hmm. think when we give, like, why do, in my experience talking, and I think I'm uniquely positioned to make this statement because I've spoken to so many restaurant owners, mm-hmm. when I get it to why, why do you do this? It's because of the the result of giving something. Right. When you give something, you, there's a return. And that return is recognition and being valued and being seen mm-hmm. for what we do. And as tribal creatures who want to have their 20% and to be seen for their unique ability to self-actualize, the cookie is knowing that you're contributing and being seen and valued for being a, for serving your role, for right. serving your part. So I think, you know, just being able to be seen, I don't know how I got down this rabbit hole in terms of what is the definition of hospitality, but I think it's very much a part of human nature to give something of value so in exchange, we can be seen yep. and recognized for it. It's well, a human need. I think we're always willing to give to those who we really care about, yeah. right? And we, we want to do what's right by them. Right. But at the end of the day, like, we have to be willing to do what's right by anyone, right? Like, don't, we don't, just because someone's a stranger doesn't mean you can just dismiss them or be a jerk to them, right? There's, like, a smile goes so far, yeah. right? And a head nod, and you... It's funny, you see, and I'm, I'm not a big city guy, but, you know, here in town, I walk around, and it's just my nature. People walk by, I smile at them, and yeah. I, I give a nod, yeah. and, that, and that's that's just who I am, and I think that that can, just that little thing can make someone's day yeah. or turn someone's day around. Family first, do better every day, mm-hmm. give hospitality. Be hospitable, yep. Be hospitable, thank yep. you. Yep. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Uh, before we wrap up, I have to have you call somebody out. Yeah. So uh, Randy's on my radar. I don't know if I'm making it to Hawaii anytime I, soon. <laughs> I don't even know where he is. He's. I know he bounces back and forth between here and Hawaii. I thought about putting my camper on a, <laughs> a, a on a barge and just there you go. Sending it out. There. There it's not go. that expensive. It's only like two thousand dollars. Oh really? And the cost of hotels out there. It's way cheaper to, to ship a yeah. truck and camper than yep. it is to 
And look, there's plenty of people that camp out on the beaches there. So yeah, and I think yeah. that my network, I, I, there's that's the one thing I'm so grateful for, man. There's so many people that are like parking my driveway. Yeah, you can run an extension cord through my garage. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I digress. Uh, who do you respect and, uh, and admire? And believe would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today. You know, I, I chatted her out earlier. Our designer Tanya uh, Gagnon uh, with How Miss. Do you spell her last name? G A G N O N. She's with Miss Details Design. Got it. Uh, she's she's awesome. Um, there's another guy. We use him for insurance. Uh, his name is David DiLorenzo. Uh, he goes by DLO or the DLO, um, but he's been he's owned restaurants. He's now in the the in insurance side of things, taking care of local bars and restaurants. Awesome guy. It's such so much energy, so much positive energy that comes from him, and so much good that he does yeah. for our industry here in town. Um, I think those would be two people that that are kind of auxiliary to restaurants, but would be great great people to talk to. You mentioned some restaurants on my way out here. You sent me an email when you found out that I was coming. Oh uh, yeah. Um, what did I have on there? Uh, Jason Jansen, good guy. He owns uh, Ahi Poke Bowl. Uh, they have several restaurants um, here in the valley, and I think California as well. Uh, he actually used to be he used to own a marketing company that we used uh, back in the day, and he transitioned into ownership and he's killing it out there. Nice, uh, fun guy. And then, um, oh, uh, Jason Asher, great guy. He owns Century Brand, Century Grand. Sorry, um, but he was he was one of the guys that was really behind the the cocktail revolution here in town. And now he's internationally recognized. Uh, Century Grand was just voted uh, number one bar in the U.S. Wow. Um, so at Tales of the Cocktail. So uh, they're doing great things. And he's just such a such a nice guy. Nice. Yep. So I got Randy, which you didn't – I mean, I think we had enough information from this <laughs> conversation that I want to get him on the show if I'm in, when I'm in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tanya. David, Jason Jansen, and Jason Ash Asher? Asher. Asher, look out. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you guys on the show. Uh, and how can we connect with you? If we're just totally inspired by today's conversation, we have questions for you, uh, maybe we want to come work for you if we're mm -hmm. in the area. What's the best way to connect? So uh, Instagram, at Restaurant Dad. Um, proud restaurant tour and a very proud dad. So yeah. that was a was lucky to, many, to score that handle. Restaurant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then if you want to just email me, jbanquil at langandlouis.com. It's my direct email. John, thank you so much, man. Thank you. For taking the time to share your story, uh, to get vulnerable, to be open. You are a shining example of what I'm looking for in a guest with, in terms of vulnerability. Thank you. And uh, just being willing to pay it forward. And if we're going to transform this industry, it's going to be through bridging the gap for people like you and the next generation. Yep. So. This is when I say, dude, there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. Cheers. <laughs>